for the top 1% than the bottom 92%. 49% of all new income goes to the top 1%. Hey, everybody. The Ben Jarofsky Show is live. Thank you to 100% of you, am I right? For the top 1% than the bottom <laughs> 92%. Okay. 49% of all new income goes to the top 1%. Ah, oh, that Bernie. You got that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm starting to set it up here. I got to find my union read. So, Ben, stall, stall, say something. Uh, uh, my name is Ben Jarofsky. It's the Ben Jarofsky Show. We're here Excellent. in the beautiful Suntime studio, and we're ready to rock and roll. All right, here we go. Before we get started into the Ben Jarofsky Show for your Thursday, April 18th, we would like to thank the following unions for bringing the Ben Jarofsky Show back. First off, it's the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers. No, not Aerosmith. Local 126 and District 8. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9. And the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. Thank you once again to those unions for jumping on board with us here. And, of course, today's show is brought to you by our dear friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. The Ben Jarofsky Show starts now. Yes, it is Thursday, April 18th, and live from the Chicago Sun-Times, Chicago Reader Studio on Racine Avenue, this is the Ben Jarofsky Show. Today on the program, we welcome Ben's right-hand man on First Tuesday's investigative journalist, Mick Dumkey. The union man, Ed Maher, will join us. And Chicago Symphony Orchestra striking member, the one, the only, making his return, Steve Lester. And now your host, <laughs> member of the Air Orchestra. He plays air instruments. Ben Jarofsky. Hello, everybody. Ben Jarofsky here. We're calling this I See Nothing Thursday. <laughs> And here's why. So for the last several hours, our crack team of investigators here at the Ben Jarofsky Show have been diligently, and I mean diligently, pouring over the 448 pages of recently downloaded Mueller report to provide you with an immediate, incredibly detailed update of what our president knew and when did he know it in regards to Putin Gate. Yes, yes. The intervention of Russian operatives to tilt the 2016 election away from Hillary Clinton and to Donald John Trump. So you get that update, D? Uh huh? Uh huh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Our crack team. Our, our crack team consists of Dr. D and me. All right. We're pretty busy here at the Ben Jarofsky Show. So, so far, Dr. D, I think, is up to page 10 of that report. Yep. <laughs> Page 11. Oh, you're really moving on on page 11. All right, listen, folks. Oh, seriousness. I plowed through some of it, and then I had to go in the air. So, uh, But from this, I know from what I've read and what I've seen and what I've heard, it sure seems to me that the powers that be in Donald Trump's Justice Department have decided to sweep this baby under the rug. Page I mean, 12. <laughs> hey, man, don't... Don't miss page 11, all right? There's a lot of stuff going on at page 11, all right? I mean, folks, they've got volumes of evidence that Donald Trump's campaign team was meeting with Russian operatives in the weeks leading up to the election. They have evidence that Russian uh, computer operatives had hacked into Democratic computers. They have evidence that Trump was finagling at the White House to figure out ways to short-circuit this federal investigation into his wheeling and dealing with Putin's Russian. But somehow or another, they don't have enough evidence to indict anyone. Isn't that interesting? Good God, what do they need? Oh, no, sorry, Ben. We need real, real good evidence. We have lots of evidence, but we don't have real good evidence. Insufficient evidence to establish that the Trumpsters, quote, engaged in criminal conspiracy to disrupt the election. So in other words... They got evidence that they conspired, but they don't have evidence to indict them from conspiring. You got that, folks? There's evidence, but there's no evidence. Well, we know President Putin Russia was up to something. We know there was a reason he had those uh, hacksters hacking into Democratic computers. We know there was a reason why they were meeting with Trump uh, officials, Trump campaign officials, but somehow or other, 
They just want you to walk on by. No crime, nothing for you to see. <laughs> you know what I'm waiting for, folks? I'm waiting for all those police chiefs, all those suburban white police officers who held that press conference last week to denounce Kim Fox, to hold a press conference holding, calling for Attorney General William Barr to step down. Please explain to me, folks. Please explain to me what's the difference between what Cook County State's attorney Kim Fox did in dropping all charges against Jesse Smollett in the face of overwhelming evidence and what William Barr has just done. Actually, what William Barr did was worse. At least Kim Fox State's attorney's office charged Smollett with something and then they dropped the charges. Barr says he doesn't have the evidence to charge Trump or his uh, acolytes with anything, even though they have the evidence. He's like Sergeant Schultz from Hogan's Heroes, a show from way before your time, Dr. D, who would like, you'd show him something right in his face and he'd go, I see nothing. That's our attorney general. I see nothing. Yeah, it's hard to see, Attorney General Barr, when you have your eyes closed. We got a great show today, everybody. Mick Dumpke will be coming in here, my partner in crime at the Hideout Show, investigative reporter for ProPublica. I know he's got a thing or two to say about Mueller. Out the Mueller Report and uh, William Barr. Plus, we'll also be talking about the uh, aldermanic elections, the new city council, what uh, what Chicago will be like uh, in the Lori Lightfoot era, what Mick thinks about that anyway, and all sorts of other political issues uh, that may uh, hop into our minds. We, you know, when you put Mick Dumpke and myself in front of a microphone, we tend to talk politics, politics, politics. Eddie Maher, union man Eddie, will be here to talk about kitchen table issues in his humble opinion that the Democrats should embrace if they're going to defeat Donald Trump in 2020. I guess the Democrats are going to have to run on the issues, folks, because there sure isn't going to be any indictment against Donald Trump for conspiring uh, with the Russians, even though there's a lot of evidence of him conspiring with the uh, Russians. And Steve Buster will make his return to talk about the ongoing strike with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Cannot believe a city, city of Chicago, that wants to be known as an internationally recognized a, attraction that would bring tourists from all over the world to come visit us would tolerate a strike like this. I think it's now heading into like its third week. So we'll get Steve on uh, for an update. And uh, plenty of political talk ahead. But before we do any of that, we got the news with Dr. D. Hey, how's it going, everybody? I'm Dennis. First off, live stream chat room. It's on and popping. Looks like we got two new people joining us here. Uh, Matrix Illuminati. Ooh, spooky name there. He says, hello. Can't wait for your opinion about the Mueller report, Ben. Oh, well, man. It's, lift carpet, sweep under. <laughs> <laughs> lift carpet, sweep under. That basically falls in. They got evidence, but they don't have evidence, okay? All right. Man, I tell you what. Can you imagine if uh, the Cook County State's Attorney did stuff like this? Well, there would be police chiefs holding press conferences. Oh, we did have the police chiefs holding the press conferences. Isn't that interesting? But uh, they see nothing with William Barr. Matrix Illuminati up top. Thanks for joining us. All right. And then Anthony Anthony says here, impeach Trump. <laughs> And then Anthony, I guess Anthony picked up the Chicago newspaper today. Says Lori Lightfoot, first black female of Chicago, uh, female mayor of Chicago. Hey, you know, new news here for Anthony. <laughs> All right. And Pat Rod says, "What up? What yeah. up, Pat Rod?" Okay, it's the middle of the day, everybody. Let's talk about the national news happening this afternoon. The Mueller report is out. I repeat, the Mueller report <laughs> is out. Yeah. The Justice Department uh, has released Robert Mueller's report on Russian interference in the 2016 election. This thing's about 400 pages long. I'm reading through it. Page 13. <laughs> Yeah. I'll get there before the show ends. Yeah. All right? There's so much news happening surrounding this thing at the moment. Uh, there's been insufficient evidence to establish at the moment that Mr. Trump or his associates engaged in a criminal conspiracy with Russia to disrupt the 2016 election. Yeah, it's pretty obvi obvious as the powers that be at the Trump's Justice Department uh, do not want to indict a sitting president or any of his top aides or his officials. They don't want to open up that can of words. Maybe they're afraid of you know what trump will do to them the retribution from donald trump or uh well they just want to cover it up but i tell you what folks there's so many people sent to jail for far lesser with far lesser evidence here in cook county all the time and they're just they're just gonna uh look the other way on this uh on on evidence that donald trump and his uh 
his aides or his advisors, camp advisors, met and conspired with the Russians. It is sweeping under the carpet at a gross level. And, um, you know, I saw the press conference today, uh, D, where um, uh, William Barr, the attorney general, was quite a performance. We talked about this with Mick Dumkey, where, you know, uh, as soon as the reporters started answering questions, first of all, to have the press conference before he releases the report, so, so sort of like, you know, uh, nobody can ask him a question based on the evidence, or nobody can ask him a base a question based on, uh, you know, what what the findings are. And then, as soon as they start acting asking tough questions, just to turn around and walk away, uh, it just goes to show you this whole thing was staged from uh, the get go. All right, and uh, let's see here. Attorney General William Barr had a press conference before the release. Mm-hmm. Ben, I believe the words you used to describe mm-hmm. that uh, was load of crap. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. It's- <laughs> Eh, something more or less along those lines. All right, and boy, Trump has been trolling hard on Twitter today. Yikes. All right, first he posted this video collage of him saying no collusion over and over again. I do have the right to fight back, and I'm fighting back not for me. I'm fighting back for the people of this country. No collusion. There was no collusion. No collusion. No collusion. There is absolutely no collusion. There's no collusion. The fact is, there is no collusion. No collusion. There's no collusion. This is a investigation where many, many millions of dollars has been spent, and there's no collusion. This is a a win <laughs> for this president. Oh, he is having a field day today, people. For now, two years has essentially been screaming there was no Russia collusion. He is backed up by Mueller. Maybe every time he said no collusion, like more than 231 times so far, maybe every time he said no collusion, he was telling the truth. This was an illegal takedown that failed. Wow. And hopefully somebody's going to look at the other side. Oh, yeah, here we go. Oh, man, he's eating a quarter pounder. Just kicking back and enjoying yeah. it today, isn't he? Oh, good God. Any thoughts on that video? Yeah, well, first of all, the bit about fighting for the people is hilarious. You know what I'm saying? Like anything he's done has been for uh, anybody other than the, the wealthiest of wealthy in this country. The only substantial thing that Donald Trump has done in terms of pa- legislative initiatives was, of course, the tax the tax cut that went down uh, last year. And uh, so that was a huge benefit for the wealthiest people in this country, perpetuating an equity that we're going to be dealing with in the state and the local level. Uh, for many years uh, to come as we try to figure out how to pay for government, basic governmental oper- oper- obligations and operations. Uh, in terms of no collusion, they had plenty evidence of collusion. They just decided not to file charges against him. It's, it's remarkable. It's like, oh, there's no evidence except for the evidence that we have here. All right, you got that? We have evidence, but there's no evidence. Okay, just move on, move on. All right, so we had that video. Now to actual tweets. Cue the ukulele. <laughs> All right, let's read uh, Donald Trump's I tweets here. I love that ukulele, man. I know, it's pretty sweet, right? Yeah. All right, uh, let's see here. This was from our president this morning. The greatest political hoax of all time. Oh, God. Crimes were committed by crooked, dirty cops and DNC slash the Democrats. Crooked, dirty cops? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I saw that one. I was like, who was he talking about? The crooked, dirty cops? All right, this next one is in all caps, so I'll have to do my yelling Donald Trump impression, which does sound a lot like Ray Romano from Everybody <laughs> Loves Raymond. All right, just bear with me, yeah. okay? Here's the tweet from Trump. It's a simple one. Presidential harassment. <laughs> oh, then he posted a Game of Thrones yeah, themed meme. Yeah. All about collusion as well. Yeah, well, obviously, uh, Donald Trump was prepared for this. Uh, <laughs> you talk about collusion. Uh, you know, uh, Justice Department lawyers have been talking to White House lawyers. Uh, Barr released that letter, a four page. Uh, what was it, about two or three weeks ago. So Trump knew what was coming down. He's waiting for this moment. Uh, he's taking uh, his victory lap, uh, if you will, because he knows there's not going to be any indictment against him. He knew he's known that for a while now. There's evidence. One more time, folks. There's evidence, but there's no evidence. You got that? All right, just keep moving on. There's evidence, but no evidence. Oh, wait, another video. Report, no collusion. The Russia investigation <laughs> is finally over. The news caught many people by surprise. This is a a win for this president who for now two years has essentially been screaming there was no Russia collusion. He is backed up by Mueller. The results Some are guy right. from CNN. And take a look say. at the headlines. 
headlines from the Washington Post to the New York Post. They're what the president wanted. The president Important has point. just been exonerated. I mean, can we just take yeah, a step I mean, back yeah. and focus on the fact that right. this is a nearly two-year investigation right. that has swirled around the president since day one of his presidency, and he has just been exonerated. And, and, and Robert. All right, you yeah, get right. the point, yeah, everybody. Donald Trump's point. having a field day. Today, okay. <laughs> Yeah, man. Well, what, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say uh, there's evidence, but there's no evidence. Just walk on by, baby. Now, of course, we'll keep you posted on these stories. Well, this story as today's program rolls along. Enough of this no collusion stuff here. Benny J, are you ready to find out what's going on in Chicago and or Illinois this afternoon? I was born ready. Love that answer. Never a bad answer, especially at this time, because coming up after this short little break, people, we are going to find out exactly. What else is news? All right. Um, uh, I can't wait for this because guess what, D? What's no that? collusion. Oh, my. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's the time of day where the doctor plucks yeah, that little yeah. trick out of his little sleeve. We'll see what it is when we return. At Chicago Land Cremation Options, we are committed to listening, educating, and guiding your family through the cremation process. Whether it is time of death or when planning your wishes for the future, Chicago Land Cremation Options can accommodate you at an affordable price and with great dignity. Avoid funeral home costs with direct access to a crematory for a cremation. Chicagoland Cremation Options, just south of O'Hare, five minutes west of Chicago. It's a family-owned business and operated by my good friend, Douglas Klein. Visit it at ChicagolandCremationOptions.com. One more time, ChicagolandCremationOptions.com. Oh, excellent job on that live read, <laughs> Benny J. Welcome back to the Ben Jarofsky Show, live from the Chicago Sun-Times. Yes, indeed, we are live from the Chicago Sun-Times. And uh, Dennis is about to take uh, the deep dive in the local news. Before you do that, D, I just want to share this uh, very funny bit that was in. Hold on. You hear that? That's a newspaper, listeners. Now, Ben, show <laughs> the listeners that newspaper. There you go. Everybody. See that? The Chicago Tribune. Yes, the Chicago Tribune. I get the Tribune, too. Uh, Joe Fournier. Fournier? Fournier? Remember we used to have him Fournier, on the show? Fournier. 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 <laughs> no, Joe Fournier is a very talented uh, cartoonist for the Chicago Tribune. And he was on our old show a couple times. Funny guy, too. Uh, I was always re reluctant to praise him because I'm so critical of the editorial board at the Chicago Tribune. I figured he'd get in trouble. But what the heck? Everybody knows I'm a big fan of Joe Fournier. Uh, for day. <laughs> but this is really funny. I got to give Joe credit. It's called, you know, his cartoon is called Op Art, and the headline is The Governor's Ode by Joe Ah Spring. Ah Spring. When a young governor's fancy turns to thoughts of revenue generators. And it shows uh, illustration of J.B. Pritzker, Governor J.B. Pritzker. He's like doing a dance. Like the um, like a dance to spring, and the title J. B. Pritzker waxes poetic, and here's what he says. Here's what Joe wrote: "Quote, I think that I shall never need a poem as lovely as this weed, this weed whose smoky lofty coal will be to fill our budget hole. Bowl. Oh, <laughs> fill Get the bowl. It? Goal? No, not bowl hole." Oh. <laughs> Uh, this weed whose smoky lofty goal will be to fill our budget hole. This weed whose seeds will legal grow in hopes our coffers overflow. And to those who ask, is this a joke? Dude, lighten up and have a toke. All right. That's pretty All good. All right. Like Joe. He's a very funny guy. That's a very funny wry man, Joe Fernier. Anyway, what you got for me, young man? All right, it's about to, we're about to find out what's going on locally. It's time for What Else is News. Preckwinkle picks herself up mm -hmm. after her loss in the mayor's race. But first, a Smollett Gate update. Yes, the ongoing saga of Empire actor Jussie Smollett and the handling of his fake hate crime case by prosecutors and our state's attorney, Kim Fox. Oh, and today's Smollett Gate update on the Ben Jarofsky Show is brought to you by the Freedom of Information Act. The Freedom of Information Act, providing the public with access to federal agency records for over 50 years. Oh, wow. That's really good to know. By the way, Mick Dumkey has entered the studio, ladies and gentlemen. Mick Dumkey has entered the studio. All right. We're going to sit him down, put him to work early. <laughs> Dumkey thinks it's a half hour. Uh-uh. Get to work, boy. All right. So this is brought to you by the Freedom of Information Act. New text messages reveal that weeks after she recused herself from the case, state's attorney Kim Fox was getting involved in the Jesse Smollett case. March 8th, shortly after all 16 felonies towards Smollett 
that were dropped by the prosecutor's text messages between Kim Fox and the guy who took over the case. First assistant Cook County State's attorney is a Joe Maggots. Is that how I pronounce that? Yes, it's good Magots? enough. Yeah, Magots. Fournier, Fournier. <laughs> It's not Joe Fournay, okay? All He's right, a cartoonist. All right. All right. We're going with maggots, I guess. Uh, yeah. Uh, they were released, right? These texts were released. And in the text, Fox calls Smollett a washed up celebrity and states that 16 felonies is pretty excessive. Let's read the text. Super casual, by the way, between these two, this text. Yeah. This is Kim Fox testing Joe Maggots. And if you're listening today, Joe, and I butchered <laughs> your last name, sorry, dude. Keep listening. Yeah. Download the show. All right. Quote This is Kim Fox. So I'm recused, but when people accuse us, uh, accuse us of overcharging cases, 16 counts on a class four felony becomes exhibit A. Yeah, I think she said the the correct way of doing that first word is so. Yeah, it's like I think four she wrote, O's. Like four O's. I mean, so. So I'm recused. Yes, there that's uh, that's what she's saying. And uh, yeah, she uh, was recused, but she's not recused. We're going to really uh, force McDumpke to investigate this one and explain what's going on here exactly. Uh, he's sort of our criminal justice expert. Uh, but uh, yes, she was recused in the case, but she was not recused in the case. She had nothing to do with the case, but yet she was involved with the case. Uh, it's a little like William Barr, our attorney general, who found evidence uh, that uh, Trump was up to no good, but he didn't find evidence that Trump was up to no good. Slippery so. slope, this It's case. a slippery slope. We just kind of want to, you know. Sweep it all under the rug. Fox then went on to compare Smollett's case to the office's pending indictment of R&B singer R. Kelly mm -hmm. on 10 charges of aggravated criminal sexual abuse. The text goes on from Kim Fox here. Quote, pedophile with four victims, 10 counts. Washed up celeb who lies to cops, 16 counts, she wrote. And then she put, just because we can charge something doesn't mean we should. Well, that's the same attitude, obviously, that William Barr has regarding uh, Donald Trump. Hey, just because we got evidence of a meeting with the Russians doesn't mean we have to charge him for meeting with the Russians. So uh, what's good enough for Jesse Smollett is apparently good enough for the president of the United States. When asked why the state's attorney continued to communicate about the case after her withdrawal. A spokesman issued a statement Tuesday night on Fox's behalf saying she reached out to maggots only, quote, to discuss reviewing office policies to assure consistencies in our charging and our use of appropriate charging authority. Mm, I'm going to have to talk to McDonkey about that. I either you're recused or you're not recused on this uh, particular issue. It's just, Sounds like a little ducking and dodging going here with our uh, state's attorney there. All right, Mr. McDumpkey is in studio. We're going to be talking with him at 1.30, so we're just going to go ahead and move on here. Uh, and after her damn near historic loss in the mayoral election, Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle <laughs> oh, yeah. has no choice but to move on as well. Yeah. But we're still a little uncertain as to how Tony plans to move forward after the runoff. The following comes from the Chicago Sun-Times and Rachel Hinton. Mm -hmm. They reached out and talked one-on-one -on -one with Tony Preck uh, Preckwinkle. The article reads, A year ago, Tony Preckwinkle ruled out seeking another term as Cook County Board President. But now, she's refusing to say whether that door will remain wow. slammed shut. Last March, Preckwinkle told the, told the Sun-Times that the term she wound up being elected to in November would be her last. On Wednesday, Preckwinkle refused to say whether that is still the plan. Here's the quote from Preckwinkle. Quote, you know, I'm looking forward to the next four years. We've got a lot on our plate, starting with, frankly, our work on the census. Billions of dollars are at stake, not just for us in the county, but every taxing body within the county, all the cities, towns, and villages, all the school districts, and not to mention our congressional delegation. When pressed further on the issue, Preckwinkle repeated, quote, got a lot of work to do. Yes, indeed. She it, does have a lot of work to do. I was going to say here, in your opinion, will this be uh, Preckwinkle's final year as Cook County Board President, Ben? Uh, what well, final term uh, as Cook County Board President? You know, I do believe, I don't think she's going to run for re-election. You asked me that question. I, You know, and reading the article, uh, Rachel Hinton's article, and listening to your quotes again, um, I'm st struck by this notion. Why did she even run for mayor in the first place? Uh, and uh, this, is, this is definitely something that I'm going to be talking with Mick Dumkey about because uh, Mick and I host First Tuesday, uh, First Tuesday of every month at the hideout. We had Tony Prokwinkle on as a guest right after she announced, I believe it was in October of 2018. And, you know, thinking of everything that has um, transpired since that moment when she announced and she appeared on our show and uh, I think of the campaign that unfolded, 
there was never like a, a, a sense that she, there was like a prevailing theme in her campaign or like a motivating issue uh, that was getting her to run for mayor. And so I am just don't understand why she ran for mayor in the first place. Uh, and, and now I don't understand why she is raising the possibility that she's going to run for re-election as Cook County Board President because um, she seemed very certain of the fact that she was going to step down then. So I don't know what's going on with Tony Preckwinkle. Maybe it has to do with the fact that, you know, it's kind of a sobering thing to end your career uh, getting slammed the way she did. What was it, 75% to 25%? Uh, and so maybe, you know, she just wants to sort of uh, fix her uh, legacy, if you will, uh, as an elected official in Cook County. Tony Perkwinkle was then asked about her current relationship with Lori Lightfoot, you know, the lady who smoked her in the election. Yeah. yeah. Perkwinkle said she hasn't spoken to the newly elected mayor since the day after the election and wouldn't say exactly how she sees her relationship with her former opponent shaping up. Here's the quote from Tony. Quote, half the people in the county are residents of the city. I worked with Mayor Rahm Emanuel on a number of issues, particularly the concerns we both had about violence in the city, and I anticipate working with the mayor-elect. Well, she really has no choice. I mean, the mayor-elect is the mayor-elect, and after May, she'll be the mayor, and uh, Tony's not going anywhere. And if Tony could have got along with Rahm on the face of all the mental health closures and the hospital closures and the crummy TIF deals... Uh, if Tony could have figured a way to get along with Rom and either support his initiatives or quietly look the other way and pretend that she didn't see what was going on, then she certainly can get along uh, with Lori Lightfoot, uh, even though she, you know, they just had this very contentious marriage race. That's how it is in politics. We all know that. Um, you have to have a thick skin. And, uh, you know, your old friend, your old enemy is your friend uh, within, you know, like, like a month or two. So uh, I think Tony Prickwell has no choice uh, but to work with Lori Lightfoot. All right. It looks like we have an update for President Donald Trump. Hold on. Collusion. There was no collusion. Okay. <laughs> no collusion. No collusion. Oh, there we get it, buddy. No we get it. That's been the same no update collusion. for the last two years. <laughs> we get it. No collusion. All right. But hey, what about that uh, one campaign staffer for Tony Preckwinkle who also voted for Lori Lightfoot? Preckwinkle expertly shrugged that one off saying, quote, so you found one unhappy camper. Yeah, I was always a little suspect about that whole thing. You know, I mean, I'm sure <laughs> there's probably more than one who voted again. I, if I were Tony, I'd say, oh, they really just wanted to have me around as president of Cook County Board. They loved me so much because I was doing a good job. You know? And to bring it all around full <laughs> circle here, Preckwinkle was asked about her former chief of staff, Kim Fox, and mm -hmm. all the aforementioned dr uh, drama surrounding her. She expressed confidence in Fox, saying, quote, she's an incumbent. I think she's going to be slated. I strongly support the good work she's done in her office, not just her refocus of the office on violent crime, but her exoneration of individuals who've been ground up in our criminal justice system. Listen, Kim Fox deserves credit. My humble opinion, we'll see if McDumkey agrees with me, in promoting the notion of alternative sentencing to throwing people into jail. I think that is an issue that has uh, long been needed to be addressed in this city, in this county, in this state, in this country, and Kim Fox deserves credit for it. And I think a lot of the, the blowback against her for the way she's handled Smollett Gate is an attempt to undercut that larger issue. And I think uh, Tony Preckwinkle, I give her credit for this, and Mick Dunkey will probably agree with me, because he was with me when we were ushering in her office many years ago and heard her talking about the need uh, not to lock up people who are... Uh, you know, convicted of like minor drug offenses, marijuana offenses. So I give both Kim Fox and Tony Preckwinkle credit for being at the forefront of this issue, at least uh, locally. So you know what? Kudos to you, Tony Preckwinkle. You ran a, you ran a lousy campaign uh, for mayor, and I still don't know why you ran, but you have been consistent on this issue, and it's probably why you have so many enemies in the law enforcement community. Uh, and Kim Fox has so many enemies in the law enforcement. That's it. I'm waiting for those suburban uh, police chiefs. Hold that press conference demanding that William Barr step down as attorney general for not prosecuting the president of the United States. So there you are. Just like that, you're now in the know of what is going on locally. And hey, by the way, everybody, we're having a caption contest today. It's a Donald Trump hugging the flag like a psychopath <laughs> contest. Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, it's that one picture of him hugging the flag. He's got a sad look on his face as well. Uh, send your captions. We have quite a few to read. We're going to be doing that at the 2 o'clock hour. 
So many captions to read. We'll be reading yours on the air. Head over to the Ben Jarofsky Show Facebook page, J-O-R-A, V as in victory, S-K-Y, at Benny J Show, B-E-N-N-Y, the letter J, show. We're going to keep the caption contest open until the end of Friday's show. And uh, who is our... Martwick, Rob yeah, Martwick. Rob Martwick. is going to be picking our winner. <laughs> all Rob right? Martwick, yes. So head over to the Ben Jarofsky Show Facebook page. Leave us your captions. We'll be reading them on the air. And now you will have an answer. The next time someone asks you, Hey, what else is news? Uh, let me tell you something. What? Something that Joe Fournier or Fournier uh, thinks. Something that Joe... Both of them. Fournier and Fournier. <laughs> and Joe Theismann. Joe Theismann, the great Joe Theismann. And Joe Van Duzer, kid I went to high school with. They hey, all Joe, agree. How's it going? You did a great job. Give yourself a, petty, a raise. Take it out of petty cash. We got Mick Dumpke sitting right Whoa. here. We're going to bring him on right after this. Ben Jarofsky Show is brought to you by the Chicago Sun-Times. For the latest in Chicago and Illinois news, sports, weather, and the latest in national news from a real Chicago frame of mind and real Chicago writers, check out the Chicago Sun-Times. Read the daily paper or online at chicago.suntimes.com. And hey, if you have a little extra cash, subscribe. And by the Chicago Reader. For a deeper dive in the daily Chicago news and for all of what's going on in this city, you gotta read The Reader. Music, arts and culture, film, extensive event calendars, concert listings, and more, including weekly political columns from writers like Maya Dukmasova and, yes, our very own Ben Jarofsky. The Chicago Reader is free in newsstands and at chicagoreader.com. That's chicagoreader.com. Welcome back to the Ben Jarofsky Show, live from the Chicago Sun-Times. Yes, indeed, we are live from the Sun-Times. Mick Dumpke in the studio, ace investigative reporter for ProPublica, columnist uh, now, uh, and my partner in crime every first Tuesday, correct, Mick? Just about every first Tuesday, <laughs> Sometimes yes. we take it off. Let's every, just call it every, let's round up. Yeah, yeah. let's round up and... Uh, uh, every first Tuesday at the Hideout, and uh, we'll be doing a show May seventh at the Hideout, six thirty. We'll probably well. I have not heard back from our guests. So I, don't I have not <laughs> either. Uh, this is what happens every time, ladies and gentlemen. But don't worry, we we pull it together somehow. So, but our plan is to talk about the uh, the new city council, the new mayor. Um, and what their relationship is going to be like. So it'll be interesting. It'll be fun. And uh, you should, all should be there. I, I will ask you about that uh, if I can, if we get to it. I know we're going to be um, have so many tangents here. When Mick and I start talking politics, we have so many tangents. First of all, I must join the thousands of people uh, throughout Chicagoland in uh, saying happy birthday to Mick. His, birth, his birthday was yesterday. And he celebrated people by going to, of all places, White Sox Park to watch a White Sox game. Is that correct? It is correct. And, Cup uh, fan. Well, that's the thing. I, I actually was surprised at how many people were like, why are you at White Sox Park? Like, I, I, can't, I can't go south of Madison Street. What's the deal here? You know? It's true. I've been a lifelong Cubs fan, but I'm a baseball fan. I, I don't cheer against the Sox. Plus, they're playing the Royals, and I've always had a thing for the Royals since they were a powerhouse team when I was a kid. So you were actually rooting for the Royals? You know, I didn't really root very loud for either team, <laughs> both of which are terrible right now. They are uh, last and second to last in the AL Central, and they played like it. But you know what? It was a beautiful day at the ballpark. And I got to tell you, one, one other thing about this, uh, not, not to you know, the, do PR for the White Sox, but. but we got there, walked up to the, to the ticket box right before the game, two tickets, great center field or uh, right field bleacher seats for $9.30 for both of them. Nine thirty, We paid nine thirty wow. to get in the game for two of us. Whoa. <laughs> Let's go Tickets right were now. selling for four dollars and <laughs> yeah. fifteen cents. Yeah, for Major League Baseball, that was awesome. At Wrigley we had Field, a great time. Now, all right. Now, I know we have plenty of political discussion ahead, but I'm going to make this a sports political. How can you tolerate? I may, I may have 
grilled you on this before, but I'm going to grill you on it again. Uh, I'm a life, well, not lifelong. I've been a Cub fan since the 60s. I root for both teams. It's a long story. I love Sox and Cubs fan. Uh, but I'm finding it increasingly harder and harder to look the other way uh, with the Cubs in light of the Ricketts' ownership of the Cubs, um, particularly their political leanings. This is just me speaking here, Mick. How do you deal with this issue with the Ricketts family and the ownership uh, of the Cubs and the, the you know the father and the anti-Muslim uh, email and the fact that one of the brothers is uh, the, the uh, chief operative for the Republican Party nationally? How do you deal with that? We're all finding it very difficult to deal with. I mean, the being an operative for the Republican Party is is actually way down the list. Um, even though most members of my family do not vote that way anymore, you know, there's a little bit of respect, I guess, if you're a party person, you want to vote, you want to work for the party, fine. Um, but the the bigotry that's come out from the, you know, from uh, Papa Ricketts and the emails that were released, and this isn't the first round of them, the most recent one, just the anti-Muslim stuff, not the first round of this stuff, uh, sickening to uh, both my in-laws um, who are Muslim as well as uh, you know my my parents and my siblings uh, that side of the family so we're having a hard time with it I'd also say Ben uh, far less important in the greater scheme of things but um, also significant to I think an increasing number of Cubs fans is just the experience of being a Cubs fan while well, everyone welcomes of course uh, the thrilling World Series victory and the fact that the Cubs have had what four playoff teams in a row um, you know are they're competitive they're fun to watch everybody likes all that but the actual experience of being a fan is less fun than it was Wrigley Field uh, they've jammed more seats in there the concourses are crowded Everything is more expensive. Uh, the Trib had what I thought was a really telling story a couple weeks ago about a lot of longtime season ticket holders who had been displaced because the Cubs decided to put in an elite box, a new section. Um, and I think you're hearing a lot of stories like that, people who are just really put off by this new culture of money, money, money. Not that the previous owners <laughs> didn't also want to make money and extract money from Wrigley Field and the Cubs, but there just seems to be this new culture that they are just so interested in, in, in getting more money out of this thing that the fan experience is way down the list. And we're supposed to uh, be happy with the fact we got a world series. Finally, everyone is happy, but that's supposed to make up for all this other stuff. And it doesn't. Yeah, no, there's something there. It's, it's though the Cubs have become bad public citizens. And it's weird, Mick, because uh, as I, I've, you know, if I take the deep dive on public financing of our sports teams, the Cubs are probably, if I'm going to do this off the top of my head, fifth in this city. The White Sox get the biggest subsidy, the right. most consistent, generous subsidy. It's ongoing. I would say that if it wasn't for the state bailout of the White Sox, uh, they may not even be in Chicago. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't be able to get a bleacher seat for four dollars and fifteen cents. So if it yeah. wasn't for the state subsidy, <laughs> right. so and I did, I did think about that yesterday. <laughs> yeah, we are underwriting that cost. Uh, the Bears, their uh, Soldier Field renovation, as ugly as it is, was financed at over six hundred million dollars by the public, and then when they got done moving all the fee, uh, the park district buildings as a result of that field of uh, that uh, project, it was even more expensive. And then of course. Uh, the United Center where the Bulls and the Blackhawks pay uh, was largely uh, funded by property tax breaks that were in uh, in, quote, in the state law. That uh, So the Cubs, relatively speaking, have gotten a lesser handout, and yet there seems to be just a, there's just more a disdainful attitude toward them. Uh, and I, I feel it, you know what I'm saying? I find it harder and harder to defend the Cubs. For yeah, this. and don't don't forget they targeted the local alderman uh, for the reason that he supposedly <laughs> didn't give them or help them get everything they wanted, which I just found breathtaking. Um, that and was in its arrogance. Tom um, Tunney is the alderman that makes alluding to forty fourth ward alderman. The best favor that the Ricketts ever did for him, by the way, uh, Mick was targeting. But yes, the arrogance. They got everything they wanted pretty much and they still were mad. They were still mad uh, just because he dared ask questions, made them tweak their plans, and, uh, and then he romped to re-election. 
So. Yeah, he romped to re-election thanks to the re- – he should you send them, like, flowers or something. All right, let's uh, – <laughs> uh, no, and that, wait, and then there's um, – I don't know if you saw this, the evidence of, like, the racist emails or that were sent to the Cubs relief pitcher. Did you, right, uh, yeah. Uh, Edwards and um, – Well, sadly, that's not unique to Cubs players or uh, Cubdom. I mean, obviously, this has happened – the NFL has just been turned upside down in the last few years. Um, Donald Trump, among others, that, that gives us a little segue. Donald Trump, among others, weighing in on uh, the NFL and some of the controversies there. So uh, sports is, you know, the, the thing about it is, Ben, I think people like you and me recognize that sports are just supposed to be fun. We look at it as an outlet. We want to, you want to lose yourself in the average Bulls game. <laughs> Uh, I spent my birthday yesterday playing hooky, going to the ballpark, um, watching an insignificant game between two losing teams and and thoroughly enjoyed it. But the truth is they uh, reflect and um, in some ways uh, uh, symbolize all the problems, social ills uh, that we write about as political reporters as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on uh, to Donald Trump. Uh, I have not had a full opportunity, Mick, to read all 448 pages of the Mueller report. What have you been doing all day? Uh, I'm know. getting on it. Uh, you know, he's 15. A, oh, he's on page 15. All right. <laughs> Dennis is making his way through it. It's tough. Uh, but I read the headlines, and um, I have to admit, it's, I'm very disappointed. Uh, there's the evidence, but there's no uh, indictment. There's evidence, but the evidence is overlooked. That's my takeaway. It just seems... It just reinforces my sense that there's a double standard, uh, an obvious double standard between high crimes committed by powerful people and just everyday crimes permitted, committed uh, by people who live like on the west side or the south side and they get thrown into jail all the time, can't pay, pay their bail, they're locked away forever. And yet we just look the other way at this evidence with Donald Trump. Well, all right. First of all, there have been quite a number of people who have been indicted, charged, pleaded guilty already as a result of this investigation. So um, I don't think we should forget that, including several of of Donald Trump's uh, top aides during the 2016 campaign. So um, all all the people on the left who are uh, bemoaning the report and don't think that it's been very strong, well, there's a long. There's a lot of people who are now uh, convicted felons as a result of this already. I don't know the exact number, but I, it's, I think it's more thirty four. It, yeah, I was going to say it's at least a couple yeah. dozen people. So that's not insignificant. Um, I, I think the one thing that uh, would have been helpful, perhaps, to both sides is to have clear conclusions. The evidence is laid out, as you mentioned, in hundreds of pages. I've only skimmed parts of it. I've been also reading the the coverage from uh, people whose jobs it is today to uh, go through this and try to detail it, uh, pull things out of it for us. Um, But one of the takeaways that I have is just, you know, that Mueller and his team, they did this extraordinary uh, work of collecting information and they laid it out in detail, but then they didn't really draw a lot of conclusions from it. And Mm -hmm. that um, left an opening for what we saw this morning with the attorney general, a bar to go basically forward and act like he was Trump's personal attorney and spin the thing as, you know, a, a near exoneration of Trump, which is specifically the report does say this is not an exoneration of the president, um, but it didn't reach other clear conclusions. So I think that's just going to fuel this uh, endless, endless debate between the various sides here about what happened and how significant it was. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you and I were joking before we were on the air that we hadn't had time to, to read through the whole thing. Well, neither have most of the people at the highest levels of government who are weighing <laughs> in on this. So that's yeah. where we are. It's, it's actually yeah. quite sad in an era where, uh, you know, facts are themselves are, are refuted. In this case, they're just being ignored. It's just a spin cycle with, with like no factual basis. Very well put. And it's a, a, a spin cycle that was set in motion uh, months ago where this Dennis plays this bit. I don't know if you heard it all the time where Trump saying no collusion, no collusion, no collusion. That's been their line and the that's whole their time. Line. Yeah. And then Barr played right into it. Uh, no collusion. All right. Uh, so what about uh, the part that uh, really irritates me? Uh, and it's funny coming from me, Mick, because you know I was all upset when Smollett Gate first erupted. Yeah, because I t- <laughs> was on the phone with me. This is ridiculous. She's taking phone calls from this person, Tina Chen, et cetera, et cetera. But the reaction 
from law enforcement types to what went down here uh, in Chicago with uh, Jesse Smollett and the investigation uh, by Kim Fox and then and the sort of the chorus that's building uh, to uh, people step down, resign. I just see, remember that press conference with the police chiefs? Police chiefs having a press conference calling the state's attorney to step down like one year into her term, or two right. years into her term. Uh, and William Barr, the attorney general of the United States saying, well, there's evidence, but there's no evidence. So let's move on. Well, I think they're a little, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. I think it's apples and oranges. I know what you're saying. In, in both cases, again, if we're taking a step back, it's sort of like facts be damned. We're going to see this the way we want to see it and not really talk about the, the facts or the legal issues in, at play. But I, I do think that the, the storylines and the cases are, are really significantly different. Um, and from what we have seen coming out from the Mueller report, uh, the uh, Mueller and his team did verify uh, contacts between the Trump team and the Russians. And let's just take a step back. Whether this meets a legal s definition of uh, a collaboration, um, whether it, it's an indictable offense, whether Donald Trump himself was involved, boy, not so long ago, the Republican Party saw Russians under every desk, okay, uh, of anyone who was left of center. And you know, they would have been outraged. I mean, just, just during Obama's term, he was a socialist, he's a communist. Well, now it's, you know, uh, certainly FTSE was played with the Russians, even if there was no legal violation by Donald Trump or his family members, or, um, well, as we said, others close to him, there were uh, legal violations apparently. Um, but a lot of people are disappointed in this report, but let's not lose sight of what it actually does say. The Russians were involved in the U.S. election, and there was an attempt by members of Donald Trump's campaign team to get information, or at least to use information that the Russians were making available on Hillary Clinton. I think that's pretty serious. Now, what are the political ramifications? Well, we have a Republican Party at this point in time that doesn't seem to care what Donald Trump's conduct is. They're going to defend him at, at any cost because they don't see a political cost. And we have Democrats now who, uh, since they've seized control of uh, one control of the, the House of Representatives, are vowing to push on with the investigation. So this is just another step in a long process. We're going to probably see... Mueller, uh, Barr are going to testify. Um, there's going to be a battle between the House and the Senate over which who's going to get whom to testify first. Uh, this is going to go on and on. It's going to go on and on. And I guess my, the part that really irritates me is that there's no attempt to find sort of, sort of a, an objective reality, if you will. And that's, no. what, I, that's what I get at uh, when I compare it to uh, what I saw with Jesse Smollett, because in each instance, there's uh, something that happened. Right. And if we just remove our uh, political views, remove who we're cheering for, remove like where we came at it, you, it, it to, the, uh, to this incidents, these two separate incidents, and just view it as objectively as possible, what happened? Right. And I, I note that when it comes to stringing up, if you will, uh, a Republican, Democrats want to be as, as objective as possible and vice versa. Correct. Vice versa. And that's my point with those rep with those white police chiefs holding that press company. They sure. were so outraged that the charges were dropped. And I'm outraged in the face of everything you just said, all that evidence that Mueller unveiled, that it, all that evidence that that, that investigation uh, uh, produced can sort of be reduced to no collusion. You know what I'm saying? A statement of no collusion uh, on the part of uh, of Trump, and then Barr essentially uh, echoing it. Um, you're right, and it won't go anywhere. Now let's let's switch it to the local level. Where just you one one other quick thought, Ben, and mm -hmm. this is something I was reading um, in the Washington Post's coverage about this mm -hmm. on the way over here. Um, there is a, uh, and I'll try to find it. If I can't find it real quickly, we'll just, I'll just paraphrase. But uh, basically, not only did Mueller specifically say that it's really up to Congress to determine the obstruction issue at this point in time to, to sort through that, but also um, said uh, essentially that um, even if it didn't meet the bar of a federal crime, that it is up to Congress to determine whether this was conduct unworthy of a president. And so I think that um, in his own 
play it by the book. Uh, you know, it's really straight laced, um, only write down exactly what you can defend in court kind of approach to the whole thing. I think it sounds like Mueller has left a trail of a lot of, of uh, eggs or goodies for people to find here. And, and run with. So that's where I think it's it's going to continue. In yeah, it'll be continue. Yeah. It'll become very political, as you uh, were pointing out, that uh, if if it becomes, as Mueller is, was leading, what you're suggesting there is that Mueller is saying, hey, Congress, if you want to impeach him uh, on these matters, go ahead. Uh, right. And if that, w- that would become completely and totally a political event, if you will. You know what I'm saying, yes. Mick? That would become Democrats versus Republicans with uh, the amen corner of Trump saying no collusion, no collusion. And any attempt to have that objective study that I was talking about earlier, where you just, well, let's just take a look at what happened here, will be thrown out the window. Absolutely. You yeah. know, and... Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's possible, if it's possible to, this is an objective study. Here's your objective study, Ben. And even you and I, who are clamoring at this moment for objectivity, find it a little bit underwhelming. Yeah. So I think that's the era we we are in, where people want clear conclusions, and they are uh, we're we're all a little bit frustrated that it's not that it that it hasn't come to something that's that's more definitive. Yeah, absolutely. Ed Maher, my uh, next guest is in the studio. Ed Maher is in the studio. I love it when my guests come early. Uh, Mick Dumkey is still here from ProPublica, investigative reporter. Uh, we were talking about the the Mueller report. Let's get back to. Uh, uh, Kim Fox and Jussie Smollett gate uh, an obsession of mine from about two weeks ago. It's kind of faded, Mick, with all the other uh, ongoing uh, news. Uh, the big story in today's papers is that they got the uh, reporters got uh, the various uh, emails that uh, Kim Fox sent to uh, her aides and that uh, regarding this matter. Uh, what's your takeaway from some of the things that you read in the paper today? Well, first of all, it's some of the emails and some of the text messages. They are what. Uh, the state's attorney's office chose to release. Um, but I, I, I think in fairness to them, not all of them are uh, necessarily look good for uh, Kim Fox. So they obviously, whatever they decided to release or not release, and I have not studied that part of it um, at all, wasn't involved in uh, foying any of this material myself, but um, they appeared to release some stuff that wasn't n- totally flattering to the state's attorney. So you have to give him credit for at least that degree of openness. Um, but yeah, I think that, uh, this is, this is another, this is another instance where it's supposed to be literally in this case, uh, it's almost being painted as a black and white issue. And it's not, I think there are two, uh, there, there are several layers of issues here. There, um, uh, it's not just how, um, Smollett was in his case were treated, uh, that's one. That's one question. It's how the state's attorney handled it. Do they follow all the processes? And then it's the waves of response by the various parties involved here. And you talked about the suburban police chiefs. We had the the local FOP has blasted Kim Fox. Of course, they've been blasting her since I think even before she got into office. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I feel like uh, to your point the question of what actually happened we what actually happened both in the you know the initial police report and the initial incident and then how it was handled at each stage of the game uh, by the state's attorney's office and others we still don't have answers to a lot of those questions and so now we're uh we're almost arguing over criminal justice reform we're arguing over um you know, it's become an argument about all these kinds of things. It's been an argument about hate crimes instead of uh, the, you know, the issue of what actually happened at that time, which we still don't know. Yeah, we still don't know. And then uh, there's, you're right. There's uh, so many aspects. Of this. One is the recusal issue. We talked about that uh, briefly uh, before you came on. What's your thoughts on this, Mick? Uh, where she said she 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 recused herself from the case, and then she was sending emails. Uh, to her underlings where she was weighing in on the case. And by the way, I, it's not that I disagree with the argument she made in the emails that uh, that there wasn't enough evidence uh, in this case to charge him with the 16 counts. Well, and, that, and, that, and that's, I guess, my point. You can be in favor of criminal justice reform. You could actually even say you don't think it was appropriate for this particular person to serve time locked up, yeah. but also say that, you know, she didn't handle this case uh, in a transparent 
manner. Yeah. And that raises a lot of questions about the office's conduct. And what's unfortunate, I think, for uh, people who are in favor of various kinds of criminal justice reform, alternative sentencing, these kinds of things, is that you know, this does not help the cause no, at all. Absolutely. Because the, because it's being the issue of whether he should have served time or gotten a stiffer sentence has been completely confused with the process that got you absolutely. to the deal that was cut. How was this deal cut? We don't know the answer to that. We I think we need to know the answer to that question. Then we can continue to discuss what appropriate sentences are for a pro for different crimes that is mick dumkey and he is absolutely right on that point uh i agree with you mick then in uh the fact i still have struggle with the fact that she took a phone call from tina chen well there's a lot about now i'm interrupting you but there's yeah. a lot about how uh state's attorney fox um i always keep wanting to call her kim because you know you talk to her or whatever how how she handled the whole thing mm -hmm. And, and it's actually very frustrating to me how she's reacted since all this came out. Um, I feel like she's undermined her own argument in, in a lot of ways. Um, and I, I agree with you, Ben. Why did she take the call? Why did she do this sort of half recusal thing? I mean, a, a formal recusal means the person who reports to you doesn't get to work on the case either. Yeah. It means you get somebody from outside to handle it as what happened with the Jason Van Dyke uh, prosecution, yeah. right? So they didn't do that part of it um, fully. They said one thing and sort of only went halfway on, on that too. Yeah. Um, there's just so many layers to this. And now we're at this point where it's sort of divided the public. It's like some people are, I'm with Kim because she's a criminal justice reformer and they're conveniently skipping over all the questions about how this particular Absolutely. case was handled. And then you have the FOP and the suburban police chiefs who are against her using this, uh, you know, to, to, to get, to jump on her for really for other issues besides this I, case. I, I, there's no objective reality out the window, gone. It's partisanship. And by the way, the same people who are saying this is an outrage that she took the call from Tina Chen. It's an outrage that she recused herself, but didn't recuse herself are awfully silent about Donald Trump firing Comey. And I bring <laughs> it back because if you believe in principles, you hold those principles, no matter what the political situation is. If it's your team that's getting and clobbered Mick then you got to stick by your principles but you know you and I know that in the game of politics it's usually the principles the first thing along with truth that goes out the window <laughs> it is definitely dispensable isn't it dispensable indeed all right let me get your thoughts on Tony Preckwinkle you know about you've been covering Tony a long time you've been interviewed her even I don't know go back to the 90s maybe um, her, her interview today in the Sun Times where she says she's thinking of serving another term uh, what do you make of all this? Well, I don't think it's um, I don't think it's unusual or, or unwise for an elected official to um, be vague about her or his planned departure date. Um, who knows how long Rom was thinking he wasn't going to run again? He's not going to announce that two year with two years to go because. Uh, it makes you a lame duck. It, it weakens you. She's already weakened by this past election, uh, the results showing she didn't win a single ward in Chicago. And um, so I think that Tony had to come back and basically say, I'm going to serve with all my energy. I got a lot to do. I'm, I'm fully in this, my current job, and then be purposely vague about whether this is going to be it for her. Because um, if she says that, then, you know, everyone is, is already dismissive of her. Then she's done and she's got almost four full years to serve still. So I think it was wise of her to, to say, well, maybe I'll, I, I'm not going to rule out, uh, going beyond this term. Yeah. And, uh, that campaign she ran, the more I think about it, the more, the worse it looks that mayoral campaign that she ran. Uh, do you think her heart was in it, Mick? Well, I wondered about that. It reminded me in some ways, uh, you and I are making these uh, apples to apples or apples to oranges arguments, so I'll make one myself. It reminded me of uh, 1992, the presidential campaign. Was was uh, the first President Bush, was he really into it? Because the same thing, you know, it, it seemed for parts of that campaign that he wasn't all there. He just didn't show the same energy. And you have to wonder after, at that point, he had been in the White House uh, more, you know, 
in the administration for 12 years was he was he okay with losing yeah. i don't think anybody ever likes to lose but you're right at a certain point in time you're like well the fates may may not be there a veteran politician recognizes that it just you know may not be in the cards i do think tony recognized well before the votes came in that she was done for in this one and she just never got her footing. The issues were not the ones she thought she was going to be able to campaign on. They ended up being about corruption and how close you were to the sun of uh, Chicago politics. And she flew too close to the sun. <laughs> the sun being Ed Burke? Yeah, the sun, sun being Ed Burke. <laughs> Sonny Burke. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, uh, four, we talked about this before. Four years ago, Rom won the runoff by talking about how much more experienced he was yeah. than than Chewy Garcia. This time, the experience was a negative. So yeah. I just think that it wasn't the campaign she expected. Now, why wasn't her team agile enough to adjust and tout her very real list of accomplishments? I don't know. Yeah, no, they they had the opportunity. I mean, that I always tease, uh, you know, people who uh, pr pr promote what I call the David Axelrod view. You know, ready to govern from day one. Uh, do you want a mayor ready to govern? From right. Day one? She could make that argument. If there's anybody who could make that argument, it would be Tony Preckwinkle. And that argument got lost, absolutely, as you're saying, in the election, uh, in the campaign. All right, now uh, we're she, she also, I could say, I keep saying this, but I just, she also could have talked about how. She got to power by making other people come to her, essentially, by forging an independent path. And then at a certain point in time, she got elected and other people si sided with her. And I would, have, I would have had an ad up throughout the campaign about how she was one of five votes against the parking meter yes. deal. Yeah, yeah. By the way, if only these people who run these campaigns were as smart as me and Mick. All right, they never who, lose. Who have never worked on, <laughs> yeah. let alone run a campaign. Man, oh, we're such. I had uh, Jason McGrath here in the studio yesterday. He's a pollster for Lori Lightfoot. We were talking about the campaign, and I realized the questions I'm asking him are all sort of embedded in this knowledge that, oh, of course I know what's going on. Right, it's it's right. Monday. The game was Sunday. Yeah, I know. I can. What an expert I am. <laughs> Oh Lord! No, anybody, any campaign would hire me or Mick to run it would be a losing That's, campaign. You got it. All right, now let's just uh, before I let you get out the door and bring Ed Maher on, let's just uh, tease folks a little bit with what we're going to talk about. We could spend the whole half hour talking about this. When Mick Dumpke and I get going, we could talk a long time about politics. But the makeup of the new city council uh, in the age of Mayor Lightfoot—it's uh, prob probably going to be different in some way than it uh, was under Mayor Rahm. Not quite sure how yet, Mick, or to what extent or what degree, but what's, uh, give, your, give folks a little bit of you know, uh, uh, what we're gonna be talking about uh, in a week or two weeks at uh, First Days. What's your sense of where the council's gonna go under Mayor Lightfoot? Well, I think we're gonna have to figure that out. You're right. But I think what we, the few, the few little pieces of the puzzle that we, we can see are that uh, the departure of veterans. I mean, uh, Pat O'Connor, the consummate insider, the consummate, uh, um, you know, uh, play ball kind of guy, deal maker, who, unlike uh, Burke, you know, didn't attract all sorts of negative publicity, uh, certainly not to the level of Ed Burke, and sort of, um, I think, was very well liked by a lot of his colleagues, at least a collegial person. And uh, so he's gone. Uh, Ed Burke, you would think, even though he won re-election, is weakened by the fact that he um, has been charged uh, by federal authorities and is no longer the finance committee chairman. You would think he's weakened. Again, that's a question mark. Do we, what happens? Um, a lot of people who are elected, particularly on the north side, who are you know, well, proudly left of center, uh, the Democratic Socialists, um, six of them, right, I think, who are, will be joining the council. What does that mean? Um, and, and then, you know, who is left to lead the way? Who, who, is, who, are gonna, who are the aldermen who are gonna captain the teams? Who are they gonna, uh, are some longtime uh, people? I think the longest serving, after Ed Burke, the longest serving alderman is Carrie Austin, who is the budget committee chair. Is she going to retain that position and the clout that comes with that? Um, 
And if she doesn't, will it be a result of her colleagues deciding to dump her or will the mayor basically, again, engineer the city council alignment? So these are just a few of the questions. Yeah, these are questions that uh, we'll have more details on uh, when we uh, convene May 7th at the hideout, 6.30. We're gonna, by then we'll know who our guests are. We would think, yeah. <laughs> We'd hope, even, even Mick and Ben are more organized uh, than just to have the, no guests until six o'clock and then we pick them up. All right, Mick, thanks so much for coming in. I really appreciate it and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. All Thank right? you. Good to be here. Uh, see you next round. See you next round indeed. Uh, yeah, we're going to have to uh, do a whole like two-hour thing with Mick Dumkey for a Saturday special. Mick and I have actually been talking about this, oh. a podcast. Yeah, we've been like nice. scheming and wheeling and dealing. Uh, and I'm going to rope him in for a, a special maybe next week. Anyway, Ed Maher sitting by. We're going to bring him on right after this. Hey there, producer Dennis here. Thanks for finding and listening to the brand new Ben Jarofsky Show. All right, so here's how this works. The Ben Jarofsky Show live streams on the Chicago Sun-Times YouTube channel Tuesday through Friday, 1 until 3 p.m. Once the show is over, you can listen to the replay on our YouTube channel or we throw it online for you to download by 4 p.m. Where can you download the Ben Jarofsky Show, you may be asking yourself? Well, you may be asking yourself a fantastic question, you can find previous Ben Jarofsky shows and guest interviews through several outlets. The Chicago Sun-Times Online, chicago.suntimes.com. The Chicago Reader Online, chicagoreader.com. And wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, pick one. Just search for The Ben Jarofsky Show. J-O-R-A. V as in victory, S-K-Y. So, let's recap. Tuesday through Friday, 1 until 3 p.m., live streamed on the Chicago Sun-Times YouTube channel and downloadable by 4 at chicago.suntimes.com, chicagoreader.com, and wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast. Yes, the Ben Jarofsky Show is back. We're live and downloaded. Tell your friends and enjoy the rest of the show. Hey guys, hour number two of your Ben Jarofsky show is moments away, but before we get into that, we would like to thank the following unions again for jumping on board and bringing back the Ben Jarofsky show. First up, we would like to thank the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 126 and District 8. How's it going, Ryan Kelly? The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9, Jeff Johnson, what up? And the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. Thank you once again to those unions for jumping on board with us. And of course, today's Ben Jarofsky show was brought to you by our friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. Hour number two, let's go. It is Thursday, April 18th, and live from the Chicago Sun-Times, Chicago Reader Studio on Racine Avenue, this is the Ben Jarofsky Show. In this hour of the program, it's the return of union man Ed Maher, and also making his return, striking Chicago Symphony Orchestra member Steve Lester. And now your host, Chicago Reader columnist, Benny J. Ben Jarofsky. Yes, indeed, Ed Maher in the studio, and I invited Steve Lester back because I think it's outrageous the city of Chicago cannot uh, figure out a way to get its striking Chicago Symphony Orchestra members back to work. Ridiculous. We want to be known as a first-class uh, city with tourists coming from all over the world. We have this tremendous asset this uh, symphony orchestra and, and the, its members are on strike. They can't cut a deal. I think it's outrageous. So we'll get Steve Lester uh, in the studio a little labor t uh, later today to talk about that. It's sort of Labor Day in the Ben Jarofsky Show on Thursday. Uh, we bring in uh, various uh, unions, various union uh, uh, representatives. Um, unions sponsor this show. Very appreciative of the fact I'm in two unions myself. So I know a thing or two about paying union dues, that's for sure. Ed Maher in the studio. Uh, we got a lot of union talk to ha ahead of us and political talk. I think uh, Ed always has a thing or two to say about uh, politics. Uh, but before we do that, D, what you got for me? You got an update? All right, people. Yes, I do. Yesterday after the show ended, we reached 
1,200 likes on the Ben Jarofsky Show Facebook page. Oh, and by the way, Ben, see that mountain ahead up there? <laughs> see that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. That's 2,000 likes. Oh, yeah. Mount 2,000. Just keep your head down, buddy. Let's keep grinding. We'll get there soon enough. Keep okay? grinding, man. That's how we do it, baby. 2,000 <laughs> likes on the way. All right. Let's keep going here. We'll get there suited up. We're having a caption contest to celebrate 1,200. It's a Donald Trump caption contest. Right now posted on the top of the Facebook page is our caption contest picture. Head over to the page right now, at Benny J Show, B-E-N-N-Y, the letter J, show. And if you need help with that last name, Ben, spell it for him. J-O-R-A-V as in victory, S-K-Y. Leave us your captions if you haven't done so yet. Let's read the captions that we have thus far, though. Now, the picture just begging for your caption is one of our president at that CPAC convention a while back. He's hugging the flag like a weirdo. He has a sad <laughs> look on his face. Oh, my God. Perfect picture to caption. So picture that, all right, as I read our first caption. Our first caption comes from our dear friend, Babs. Oh, okay. What's he got? Ben's favorite, Babs. All right. Bab type. Babs, man. Big, uh, big time listener to this show. Once again, Donald Trump hugging the American flag with a goofy look on his face. And uh, Babs caption, <laughs> I usually have to pay $130,000 for a hug. That's pretty oh, Ben liked it. Ben liked it. All right. How about uh, let's move on to our next cap. Oh, man, Ben really liked that. I, the joke is coming home. Wow. Yeah, it cost 130 grand to shut him up. Uh, yes. All right. On to our next caption here. Let's do, okay, let's Darlene. Darlene's caption. Darlene puts, America, help me. I did many wrongs. Yeah, yeah, I just see your Trump imitations kind of getting to me. All I right. was going to say, I think it's getting better and better. Yeah, oh, wow. Practice, all right. Man. I'm on audition for SNL. All right. Yeah. All right. On to uh, Joseph's caption. Joseph says, uh, Spake me harder, store me. Oh, okay. <laughs> a little much. All right. Let's uh, see here. Spank me <laughs> And how about uh, Hugh's caption? Hugh's up next. Uh, Hugh's caption, What? I don't feel good. I haven't made poopy in three days. Oh, okay. okay. All right. We got some <laughs> comedians here. <laughs> All right, how about Steve's caption? Once again, Donald Trump hugging the flag with a goofy look on his face. Steve's caption, I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking it to the union. Putin doesn't even care. Yeah, that he is sticking it to the union. We'll be talking about that with Ed Maher, yep. All right, how about Dar? What's going on, Dar? She left a caption. I even hugged the flag so I can please stay in America. So, oh, so can I please stay yeah, in America? Yeah. Donald Trump, oh, not a great leave. reader. Oh, by the way, I'm re I'm trying to get to the Mueller report, by the way. Oh, yes. Yeah. Page 16. All right. You're making your way through. It's only uh, 432 pages I know. left to go. I'm then. working. By the end of the show, I'll probably get that going on. All right. Uh, let's see here. We read that one. Let's see. Okay. We got Joseph's caption. Once again, Donald Trump hugging the American flag with a goofy look on his face. Joseph's caption. My God, Donnie, stop groping the flag. Okay. Yeah, Ben likes it. Ben likes it. He's groping it. the flag. Yes, right, he is. Let's do two more here. It is a here. weird picture, man. We'll Have do... you seen that picture, Ed? Have yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it right, right. now. <laughs> you know, I've, I've yeah, seen a lot sure. of politicians, um, you know, wrap themselves in the flag, but I've never seen one wrap the flag in themselves. Oh, <laughs> Mars, be the, do the, uh, a bit of zanies. Oh, was... How about Brian's <laughs> caption? Uh, Brian puts, uh, clinging to the stars before he's stuck behind bars. Oh, that's actually good. That's, that's very, very good. Get the, you know, get the frozen stuff. Steaks to him right now. We don't give away steaks. Oh, I thought we did. All okay. right, and uh, we'll do one more here. Mm -hmm. Let's do Joseph's caption. Now, Joseph, when we uh, did the old show, you know, the show we had before Ben got fired, <laughs> Joseph Joseph was excellent at caption. We, yes, he was. We called him Captain Caption. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Joseph has left us his latest uh, caption here. Once again, Donald Trump hugging the American flag. Joseph's caption, I'm going to add a star for Mar-a-Lago <laughs> to this flag. That's good. Keep the captions coming. We're going to keep this contest. Caption. We're going to keep this contest open until the end of Friday's program and where uh, Illinois State Rep Rob Martwick. Martwick is going to have to make the yeah the the decision here. Uh oh, pressure on Martwick. There you go. So hey, to give you a little teaser, maybe help out some of you listeners. Rob Martwick plays guitar, so maybe throw in some guitar captions if you want to win this caption contest. All right, very good. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis, and to uh, all the listeners. That's some funny stuff. Uh, Ed Maher, my guest, and uh, union man Ed Maher, operating engineers, Local 150. You know, Ed, uh, you people may not know this or remember this. I do. 
Uh, Ed briefly uh, was sat in for Norman Goldman, our good friend Norman Goldman. At one point, you and Jake Lewis were sitting in for him, uh, t- handling phone calls from all over the country on Norman's show. Yeah, uh, on had that a great time with Jake doing that. Doing that it was a lot of fun. I was listening to you with my good friend Melissa, still my friend, uh, even though things have happened and have separated me from that station. But it's anyway, complicated. it's complicated. But. Um, so you know how to deal, uh, you had to deal with uh, Trump supporters calling in uh, as sailing uh, people, the, the investigators into Trump. What's your, what's your sense now uh, with the Mueller report having emerged, you've, uh, the bar, Attorney General Barr's press conference, a little bizarre scene this morning. Uh, what's your sense now of how the, uh, the Trumpsters are going to play all this? Uh, going forward. Imagine if you were still holding that show, what kind of questions would you be getting, you and Jake getting, as uh, you dealt with the Trumpsters? I mean, I think the headlines on conservative news today is are no collusion. That's what uh, the president tweeted out shortly after the press conference started. You know, he won the election. He hired an attorney general. He, he set up the infrastructure infrastructure to put himself in the best place possible with whatever the result of this investigation was. Um, do I think, I mean, I watched the, the press conference this morning with Attorney General Barr, and when he started to talk about how devoted the president was and how emotionally hurt he was by this investigation, it was, you know, I thought to myself that that's very disappointing, but that's the power you get when you appoint the Attorney General. So the, there's a lot, I haven't had a chance to read the report, it'll probably be well into tomorrow before I really get a, a firm grasp on it, but... Um, I think that there's probably going to be investigations that are spurred by, you know, revelations from the report. But I think we have to recognize, um, you know, we meaning folks on the left and folks that have disagreements with uh, the way that the president has handled this and many other matters. We've got to start to to kind of move on. We can't make fighting over this the next two years because that's how we get um, another four years easily for for President Trump. Um, you know, he's, he's the president, he's got the, the pulpit, he's got folks in place to help him spin this. And so if there are going to be investigations, let those things happen, uh, let them be legitimate. But when, when somebody, when you go after somebody and you're unsuccessful, uh, I think of Scott Walker in Wisconsin, Mm -hmm. they went after, they did the recall election on Scott Walker and it was unsuccessful. It made Scott Walker stronger. Uh, and that's the danger here is by putting all your eggs into the um, into the investigation basket. If it doesn't come back as a blockbuster success, he's stronger. Um, so anyhow, regardless, um, the report is out. Everybody's going to have a chance to read it. Um, things that have been redacted or things that were spun in ways that uh, people are unhappy with. This is the world we live in, and we've just got to, if we're going to be successful in two years, we've got to start to talk about how we're going to change things, how politicians are going to change things. Because in the background of all this, the, the president's appointing people, he's making policy, and that's what's got to be the focus because a lot of things have, have happened in the background quietly while everybody's been looking at this big shiny object. Yeah, all right, now that's a perfect transition to uh, what I want to talk to you about because you're absolutely correct. It's going to have a life of its own, this investigation, even if no, there's no uh, new indictments. Uh, Mick Dunkey was correct in pointing out there have been indictments in the past even if there's no new indictments even if no there's no criminal case lodged against the president himself or his son etc cetera, etc cetera, uh there will be uh, investigations and hearing in the meantime uh in your humble opinion what are the issues that uh, uh trump's challengers should champion if they want to let's say uh address concerns to working people to union people, uh, to middle class people, uh, who feel as though maybe this administration is not really looking out for their interests. What are the issues, in your humble opinion, uh, that the Bernie Sanders of the world or Kamala Harris's of the world, the candidates should be championing? Sure, I, I think that they would be referred to as kitchen table issues. Um, there was a little bit of press last week about some union leaders that made announcements about um, the fact that they thought that some of these more uh, press-worthy issues like um, perhaps the wall, the filibuster issues, things like that were popular and they grabbed headlines. But what really moved voters are these kitchen table issues like um, folks across the country are worried about being able to afford insurance and be able to afford insurance health care that they can actually use. 
uh, not these high deductible plans where it only comes in handy if you have a catastrophic uh, illness. Um, things like that, things like um, you know the, the flatlining of wages over the last 20 years, actually the decline of wages over the last 20 years when adjusted for inflation. But people are worried about getting by, about putting food on their table. Um, so we can all talk about the filibuster, and those issues are real, uh, but they don't, they don't impact broad swaths of American voters in the way that things like health care do. We saw in November um, Democrats leaned on health care, and Republicans, frankly, um, played a perfect foil for going after pre-existing conditions, trying to take that part out of Obamacare. And, you know, Americans of all political stripes, it's, in, it's insane to think that, you know, eight or nine years ago, if you got sick while you were at one job, you had to stay at that job. Otherwise, you'd never get coverage for that illness. It seems like something that would have happened 100 years ago, yeah. but it was less than 10 years ago. And, and this administration was talking about pushing us back to that. So that was an issue that drove voters. Uh, Democrats won. This blue wave was driven by health care. Um, and I think, frankly, that um, the Republican side, the Trump administration, has kind of set itself up for another round of that because – it's once again, um, you know, the administration has issued briefs uh, saying that it agrees that the entirety of the Amer Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional and should all be struck down. If it's all struck down, you're going to wind up with folks who had coverage that are not going to have coverage and people with pre-existing conditions that could lose that. I think Americans in the last 10 years have seen what the, it's not even the good life. I mean, it's a little tiny sliver of the good life of what, you know, healthcare in other countries perhaps is like, but um Protecting people for pre-existing conditions, that's a pretty basic thing. And now that we've seen, like, yeah, that makes perfect sense, it would be insane not to do that anymore. Um, you know, I think going back to that would be would be problematic, and uh, voters of, of any political stripe would agree with that. Uh, we have a uh, – I don't know if you heard this, um, uh, Ed. We, he, we were playing a lot yesterday, uh, Bernie Sanders on Fox TV. Extraordinary moment, I thought. Because uh, here you have Bernie Sanders, who's the antithesis, uh, you know, I mean, the epitome of a uh, of like a lefty in this country, you sure. know, Democratic. He won't even call himself a Democrat half the time, Democratic Socialist, what have you, uh, going on the most conservative uh, TV show in a town hall meeting. I think he's the only Democrat who's done the town hall. And he called out for uh, uh, Medicare for all. And he got such a resounding cheer that the cynic in me thought that he had packed the audience. I've since read Fox TV swearing up and down that it was not packed by Bernie. It was legit. Can we play that for Ed so he can hear this one, D? This audience has a lot of Democrats in it. It has uh, Republicans, independents, Democratic socialists, conservatives. Uh, I want to ask the audience a question, if you could raise your hand here. A show of hands of how many people get their insurance from work, private insurance, right now. How many get it from private insurance? Okay, now of those, how many are willing to transition to what the senator says, a government-run system? Millions of people every single year lose their health insurance. You know why? They get fired or they quit and they go to another employer. I was the mayor for eight years. You know what I did, what probably every mayor in America does? is you look around for the best insurance program, the most cost-effective insurance. You change insurance. Every year, millions of workers wake up in the morning and their employer has changed the insurance that they have. Maybe they like the doctors. People are nodding their heads, okay? So this is not new every year. Now, what we're talking about, actually, is stability, that when you have a Medicare for all, it is there now and it will be there in the future. <laughs> okay, it's cheering at a Fox town hall for Medicare for all. When when Bernie agreed to do that town hall, I kind of I couldn't help but think, you know, ask myself, what's Bernie thinking? And when I watched it, I said, what was Fox News thinking? You know, because there he he threw out some Trump lines, and the, the whole crowd went wild. It, <laughs> it kind of made me think, who's in this crowd? Like, you know, if, if Fox didn't pack the room, um, they probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> they probably shouldn't have had the town hall because. Um, but I, I think that, that, that what Bernie's talking about is absolutely right. Um, and I th the way also that, that Fox News and a lot of uh, other folks will spin this is that um, a lot of people get insurance from their employer. And mm -hmm. under a single-payer plan, they wouldn't get that anymore, as though those people are going to be left out or not get insurance or something like that. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people, like friends of mine, who have good jobs, you know, six-figure jobs, who've got health care that, you know, with like a $7,500 deductible every year. Nobody, almost nobody, unless you get really, really ill, 
meets that $7,500 deductible. So these same friends of mine don't go to the doctor for routine things, or they'll plan a big procedure and then scramble their family into the doctor to take care of everything. That's not healthcare. That's not what, what this is supposed to be. I mean, if you don't go to the hospital or get your checkups, you're going to get those, those terrible illnesses. It's going to take years off your life. So um, just because you have private insurance doesn't mean you have good insurance. Like there's a whole notion. Um, it's, it's almost being classified this way as, as a benefit um, referred to as cancer insurance. Now, cancer insurance doesn't actually exist, but these high deductible plans are more often being referred to as cancer insurance because the only way you ever crack that deductible is if you get cancer. Mm. Um, you know, I, I'm very, very fortunate. I'm a member of a union, and I've got a good plan. I've got a good health care plan that's negotiated by the union for me, as do members of Local 150 and many other, um, many other unions. So I have a, a low deductible. I, my daughter goes to the doctor and gets her checkups as she should. If she's got a, an earache, we take her to the doctor and get it taken care of. That's the way that healthcare is supposed to work. Um, avoid catastrophic injuries and illnesses that could have otherwise been avoided. Um, and so I think that the healthcare system in America is broken. Um, a lot of it is policy, and a lot of that, I think, is because the lobbying group um, for American healthcare is bigger than alcohol, tobacco, uh, gun rights, any of that stuff. It's all dwarfed by healthcare. The amount of money that um, you know, pharmaceutical manufacturers, healthcare providers, health networks, and things like that put into lobbying is unbelievable. I mean, it would, it would, it would be shocking. I, I don't know if there are documentaries out there about this, but there should be because Americans should know um, that without like a drastic change to the way that this country provides healthcare, if we try and do it kind of piecemeal. Um, it, nothing's going to be done that benefits the American people um, that, that leads to better coverage for less money. I don't see a way that it happens without a dramatic change um, you know, towards something like a single-payer plan. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what the answer is, but something like a single-payer plan is the closest thing that I've heard. All right, let's get into that because uh, I've lived through so much debate on health care, and I've watched it change. I don't know how much it's changed. Let me tell you my point. Uh, when the Clintons got, when the Clintons, I thought of them as a team, when Bill Clinton was elected uh, president, well, he put his wife in charge of the health care. That's why I said the Clintons. Mm-hmm. He put Hillary in charge of a task force to bring in health care. This is back in 93, uh, Ed. And um, they were unsuccessful. And largely they were unsuccessful because the in, uh, insurance industry um, fought them so hard and and presented this notion that people would lose something concrete that they had, what you're talking about, their private uh, plans. I've now, we've now evolved to the point where uh, Bernie Sanders can go on Fox TV and get loud cheers calling for what the Clintons wouldn't even try to do, get it back in 93. Um, do you think that this country has moved on on this issue to the point where like, People in your union, for instance, would say, you know what, I got a good plan, but I'm willing to give it up for a, a universal plan. Or do you think we're still sort of stuck where we were in 93? You know, I think the other end of the spectrum of folks who have, you know, essentially meaningless health care that still costs a tremendous amount of money to them, mm-hmm. that that population is growing. I mean, I, I personally, um, the plan that I have is very good, um, but it costs an extreme amount of money for, for family coverage. It's, you know, it's over $20,000 a year. So, and that's not, I mean, that's, that's for a a plan that can actually be used that I can use for wellness for, for whatever, something that I can go to the doctor and not walk out with a a 500 or $1,000 bill uh, Mm -hmm. coming to me in the mail. Um, So when folks talk about the cost, you know, we're going to have to pay higher taxes. And if they had to raise taxes two to four percent, which are kind of the numbers that they throw out to institute some sort of a social uh, single payer health care plan, if you make one hundred thousand dollars a year, it's going to cost you two to four thousand more every year, mm-hmm. right? Two and four percent. Yeah. Right now, like my health insurance plan costs twenty thousand dollars a year, um, so that number on the tax end is not huge. Um, now, other countries have done things like I. I've always looked at New Zealand um, with the, their approach to, to social medicine and single payer healthcare. It sort of creates tiers where certain doctors will go into networks and you've got to pay additionally for like a, a supplemental network or something like that. And I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if something like that happened here. Um, but even in a situation like that, um, there are options. 
Uh, if people demand a certain specific doctor at a certain specific hospital and they have resources to do that, they'll be able to do that. But other people will not go bankrupt for being sick. You know, I, um, I hosted about two years ago. I picked up um, a fellow member, a sister from the Operating Engineers Union. She was coming down for a conference from Canada, so she'd never been to Chicago. I took her for a ride, showed her the, the sites briefly uh, before taking her to the conference, and we got on the topic of healthcare. And, you know, she talked about how her sister had gotten cancer. And she's like, if that happens here, do people go bankrupt? And I said, yeah, yes. yeah. Like almost yeah. as often as not, probably the answer is yes. Um, and I asked because I had a, I had a, uh, my daughter was born when I was, I think I was 26, 27 years old. And I remember they, they told me shortly before that, um, it's going to cost like $20,000 to have a child. I was like, oh man, I guess I never thought about that. It costs money to have a kid, let alone it costs <laughs> as much as a car to have a child. <laughs> Um, yeah. but I asked, I asked her about that. Yeah. Um, and she said, no, it's free. You, you go to the hospital, you have your child, but you have to share a room. You don't get a private room. You get, you know, one other person in your room. And, uh, and I was like, well, how much does it cost if you want a private room? She's like, Ooh, it's like 80 or a hundred dollars a night. I was like, that's how much aspirin costs for, you know, for one yeah. when, I, when you go to the hospital. So, um, the, the way that it's being done here, I, I, I recognize, like I would, I would feel good about, um, I'd feel better about the decision that I've made, or I'd feel good about the decision that I made if I knew that people who were poor had access to health care and weren't going to die because they were poor. Because, you know, I grew up in a, a middle class family and we were middle class, but not by a whole lot. And in the environment we live in today, I don't know if my parents could have afforded health care to, to take care of me. Yeah. So, you know, I've got a lot more in common with the folks who are going bankrupt because they can't afford health care than I do with people who don't care about the people on the streets. And I think that that rings true for a lot of a lot of middle class people. But, you know, the time for uh, for facts to come out about what that system looks like really is now because Americans are fed up. Republicans are fed up with health care. Democrats are fed up with health care. If there's an issue that moves voters in the last, you know, three, four, Absolutely. five years, that's the one. They I just agree have with to have you. a good plan. So put some of the put some of the Hollywood, you know, stuff aside and Let's just get serious about policy. I, uh, Lauren Underwood w was victorious in the 14th congressional district and largely running. And she wasn't even talking about single payer. Mm -hmm. uh, she wasn't even talking about Medicare for all. She was just talking about uh, expanding health care coverage so that uh, we could guarantee that the uh, premiums were lower or the deductibles lower for people who are paying for their own insurance. She was just talking about reforming it, if you will. Uh, and I do believe this is an issue that uh, could really uh, work against Donald Trump. I think that's why McConnell it keeps trying to, uh, Senator McConnell from the leader of the Senate, keeps trying to pull Trump away from attacks on Obamacare. But, you know, he, he just goes into that little attack mode, Ed, where he just starts attacking Obamacare. Um, another issue that you talked about briefly with me on the phone today, I want to talk about, I don't know if there's any legislation for this, is, is uh, pr pr providing some kind of protection for folks who are in the gig economy. And this is, uh, we, we were talking about this GIG, gig economy. Talk a little bit about that, Ed. Yeah, so I think everybody knows somebody who's quit their job to go into uh, driving Uber or Lyft or something like that or couldn't get a job, so they wound up doing that. Um, so MetLife, every year they come out with a study on benefits, and one of the things that was really interesting in this year's was they said that 23% of uh, the current full-time American workforce plans to leave in the next five years to join the gig economy. So these are 23%. 23%. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a much larger number than I ever would have guessed. Um, but people's needs are increasingly not really being taken care of at work. So they're opting for freedom rather than, um, you know, being stuck in a cubicle and not, uh, you know, the things that stress people out. And this is from that study. Um, you know, employers more and more have to do a better job of taking care of employees out of work life. Just taking care of the, the stress that distracts them. You know, you get a happier workforce, a more efficient workforce, all of those things. And the things that distract people are, can they afford their health care? Are they going to be able to retire one day? Um, do they have enough to, to cover an unexpected expense if it pops up? Um, so these are all things that, that workers are increasingly not getting. And I mean, the, the, the unfortunate thing is, if you shift into the gig economy, um, that doesn't mean it's very unlikely that you're going to get any kind of health care coverage from, 
you know, driving um, for Uber or delivering for DoorDash or something like that, it's going to be the same problem. Uh, the benefits that are provided are going to be almost nothing, um, but you're, you're getting kind of a, a sense of freedom from, you know, being chained to a desk at a job that's also not really giving you benefits. So I think that um, if, if the way of the industry, and also in the last 10 years, a, a Harvard and Princeton study found that in the last 10 years, 95% of the jobs that have been created in America mm -hmm. have been in this non-traditional gig, temporary contractor, uh, independent contractor, freelance uh, category, all of which, again, don't really provide benefits. So people who are getting jobs now, the, the benefits of, of full-time work are almost, they're, they're disappearing. So if people are stressed out, number one stressor for workers in America, health care. If they're stressed out about it and they can't get it through a job, there's got to be some way that we can we can provide that. Um, like I think that's a policy that that would be um, that should be explored. Find a way to just take care of these problems so that no matter what a person's doing, healthcare is an option. It's an an affordable option. Um, but again, I mean, going to college it's not it's not really paying benefits for folks as as it used to. Um, I don't know. I don't really approve of the send everybody to college for free because I don't really believe everybody should go to college. Mm -hmm. I went to college with a lot of kids that probably didn't need to be there. And yeah. some people might even have said that about me. <laughs> <laughs> and those people are wrong. But He uh, was a scholar. Yeah. Okay. 40% 40, 40 of people who go to college <laughs> yeah. don't graduate, don't get a degree. Yeah. The people who do, two years after they get out, 45% of them have jobs that don't require a college degree. Um, and yet, the amount of the number of college and of college debt, the amount of it, um, has doubled in the last, or uh, more than doubled in the last ten years. It's a trillion and a half dollars. So, um, you know, as I said, I, I'm I'm here. I'm a union member. Apprenticeships and things like that are a good option because people who graduate apprenticeships, more than ninety percent of them are employed when they graduate. Yeah. They earn money during that, and they almost always come out debt free. Yeah, you get a job with healthcare where you make the best wages you really could make because you've got people negotiating on your behalf. You don't have to worry about it. Um, and then uh, you can retire. Yeah. You know, you've got a couple of different avenues to retire. So, um, and again, no college debt. Well, I, I think that when people talk about publicly uh, financing college, I think they're talking about uh, public universities, community colleges, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're talking about Harvard or Yale. Or oh, Columbia. for sure. Yeah. So if you want to go to Harvard or Yale, you got to pay for it yourself. Uh, but I do believe... Uh, well, I don't know if I'll live long enough to see this, Ed, but I do believe that's a direction we have to head uh, toward. I look at the, the the millennial generation that's shackled with so much college debt, uh, and then they're entering an economy uh, that's so volatile, mm -hmm. uh, the gig economy that you're talking about, and uh, companies feel free just to uh, hire people on limited uh, part-time basis without benefits. So then how you get benefits? You're paying for Obamacare. Meanwhile, Trump and the Republicans, every time you turn around, are, are threatening to eradicate Obamacare somehow or other. That's our about our liberty, it's to eradicate it. So think about that, the debt, the volatility in the workforce and the unpredictability of your healthcare. I don't know what kind of future there is. So I I do believe these are not only um, uh, long-term practical solutions to the, the ills of our country, but they're also winnable, which to your point that we started with, winnable issues that the Democrats can run on. That's for sure. I, I've got to briefly just throw a shout out to Kim Ortiz. Uh, she works at Local 150 and she's a proud millennial. And uh, <laughs> I, I will say she is a humongous fan of yours, Ben. Oh, okay. But she does take note. There's a lot of millennial bashing. So yeah. I'm, one of these times I'm going to bring her with me and uh, I'm going to let her you know, give it to you from the, the millennial well, perspective. I love millennials. Uh, there's a millennial right over there. Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, 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 and, and there's also a millennial who sort of was a millennial at one point or another, Steve Lester has entered the studio. We're going to bring him on uh, from the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. He was on about a month ago. I thought for certain uh, this strike would have ended uh, by now and we'd have him on uh, to play his instrument, do a little singing uh, in jubilation. Instead, this strike is still going on. I say uh, what I've been saying all day, Steve Lester, when I said last time you're on the show, it's an outrage. Absolute outrage. The city of Chicago wants to think of itself as a first-class, world-class city of the world, where people come all over the world to the city of Chicago, and we have our uh, our symphony is out because of the strike. So we're going to bring Steve Lester on when we return. The Ben Jarofsky Show is brought to you by the Chicago Sun Times. 
for the latest in Chicago and Illinois news, sports, weather, and the latest in national news from a real Chicago frame of mind and real Chicago writers, check out the Chicago Sun-Times. Read the daily paper or online at chicago.suntimes.com. And hey, if you have a little extra cash, subscribe. And by the Chicago Reader. For a deeper dive in the daily Chicago news and for all of what's going on in this city, you gotta read the reader. Music, arts and culture, film, extensive event calendars, concert listings, and more, including weekly political columns from writers like Maya Dukmasova and, yes, our very own Ben Jarofsky. The Chicago Reader is free in newsstands and at chicagoreader.com. That's chicagoreader.com. If you would like to advertise with The Ben Jarofsky Show, and who wouldn't, contact Tracy Bame at publisher at chicagoreadercorp.com. We have several advertising options for your business or organization, and quite frankly, we would love nothing more than to tell our listeners all about it. Once again, that's Tracy Bame at publisher at chicagoreadercorp, at C-O-R-P as in Paul, dot com. To advertise with the Ben Jarofsky Show, the Chicago Reader, and the Chicago Sun Times. We look forward to plugging you. Okay, well, that came out kind of weird. More of the Ben Jarofsky Show live and downloaded in moments. Hey, welcome back to the Ben Jarofsky Show. Live from the Chicago Sun-Times. Yes, indeed, we are live. Ed Maher in the studio with me. Uh, Steve Lester has joined us from the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, bass player for the Symphony Orchestra, one of the leaders of the union. And they've been on strike now six weeks. Good God, six weeks. Uh, he's going to get a, uh, an update on what's going on and what it's going to take to settle the strike before we do that. D, you got an update for me? Absolutely, I do. As I try to read through the entire Mueller report, <laughs> by the way, page 20. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, 418 to go. I'm getting there. But as I do that, Ben, we got to talk about something here. It looks like a Chicago legend has passed. Longtime Chicago sportscaster Chet Kopik Mm -hmm. dies at age 70 after a car crash. Yeah, no, Chet Kopik. I knew Chet, and uh, I saw that. I was really sad to see that 70 years old. Uh, I I know we're not allowed to talk sports on the Ben Jarofsky show. Uh, You Pro we'll hits. allow it this time. All right, but uh, I was a big fan of Chet Kopic. He had a radio show, a sports radio show in the 80s and the 90s, and he was quite a character. The guy knew more about Chicago. His, the stuff he had, you tease me about how much I know about Chicago politics, you know, like the Rain Man quality I have. Uh, Chet Kopic displayed that with uh, sports. Uh, his knowledge of sports was incredible. He, like new numbers, like a uh, good old number fifty-one. You know, for the I, I, I'm not good with numbers, Ed. I wouldn't know the numbers of the players, but he knew them all, and he was very entertaining. And I learned a lot listening to him. Uh, people, I got into the radio business very late in life, uh, thanks to Dennis. And uh, but I'd been listening to radio my whole life, and uh, one of the the people I really enjoyed listening to one of the most entertaining. Uh, voices on radio for uh, many, many years was Chet Kopic. Really sad to see uh, that he died. Once again, longtime Chicago sportscaster Chet Kopic passed away at age 70. All right, very good. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Ed Maher in the studio is still with me. We're joined by Steve Lester uh, from the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Steve, welcome back. Thank you. Nice and to see you, Ben. It's nice to see you, too. I wish it was uh, the moment of jubilation the last time you were on here, so I'm going to bring you back when you're victorious, but... Well, we're still out on strike. Um, we've been walking the picket line now for almost six weeks. Um, and uh, it doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon. All right, let's talk about that. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to end anytime too uh, soon. I've never been involved in protracted labor negotiations. With, uh, well, strike ones. I've been in protracted labor negotiations, but never where they were in strike. Uh, the papers were filled with stories about a week ago or so that said, and I'm doing this off the top of my head, uh, the CSO leaders had said they gave you their, quote, last and best offer, unquote. Right. Uh, right. What does that mean? Well, 
uh, a week ago Monday, so it's now almost uh, nine days, something like that, eight, ten days. Um, they did give us their last, last, best, and final offer, which is, um, I guess it's a legal term from negotiations, which um, ba basically means they're not going to continue to counter our offers. This is a take it or leave it offer from the employer. And uh, we brought it to our membership uh, in a detailed, long meeting where we laid it all out factually without any uh, opinion in the first part of the, the, um, the meeting. And then we let the membership answer, ask questions, make comments, and then we took a secret ballot vote uh, per the uh, union bylaws, and it was overwhelmingly rejected. So we were, we were back on the picket line Monday morning, mm. or Tuesday morning. And uh, when that news was delivered to the uh, other side, uh, to, I, I want to. I can't call them the owners of the Chicago Symphony. I don't know what to call them. We just call them the employers. The employers, okay. <laughs> the employ When that uh, response was brought to their attention, what did they say? Well, there was a uh, dead silence, and then they canceled two weeks, <laughs> two weeks of concerts. So it was. Um, they didn't, you know, discuss anything or make any attempt to schedule additional sessions or communication of any sort. So um, there was some back and forth later in the week involving our federal mediator and the attorneys. And so we did sit down last Tuesday, a few days ago, and we presented them with yet another compromise offer. Mm -hmm. And they just looked at it for about 30 minutes, which isn't very long in negotiations, came back in after their caucus and said, we're just going to restate our last, best, and final offer, which is basically a, I, I could say something, but I'm, <laughs> it's, it, it's not a, a very polite way of uh, doing business. And so that's where you stand right now? Have there yeah. been any meetings since then? No. All right. Now, um, if you can, please just sort of uh, distill it for us. What's the issue here that's preventing um, a deal? To, a well, deal? It, you know... You can always look at it two ways. You can look at it from the money side, and then you can look at it, to what does it actually mean to us in the workplace? So uh, f from the money side, it's salary and pension, of course. Those are always the big issues in negotiations. But from the player's side, from the workplace side, what does it mean? It means that they would be creating, in the pension side, two class of employees, those with their current benefits and then go, those going forward with significantly reduced benefits. Mm -hmm. And we don't think that's a good idea. That's not going to sustain the quality, the quality of the orchestra. So there's, nothing's changed. This is, I remember this from the right. last time we were on the show. It's essentially right. a two-tier uh, proposition that right. they're having. There'll be uh, the older guys, uh, my generation yep. uh, of, of symphony members, uh, who will be under one plan, and then uh, Ed's beloved millennials, uh, they, they all have, <laughs> they're, uh, love too. yeah, I love millennials too. Does. Uh, they would, this gets into the heart of what Ed and I were just talking right. about, how it's like right. this whole new generation. Right. And, uh, and, and the old timers are holding tight. This is yeah. the interesting part about this strike because yeah. you're protected, Steve Lester. Yeah. I'm not going to get much out of this one way or the other. So it's really just about the future of the orchestra. But, you know, it's not that surprising. We give our working lives to the orchestra and to the community. We start when we're in our 20s or 30s, and we stay here for our entire lives. Mm -hmm. So it's not unusual that people who retire, retire with 40, 45 years some, sometimes of service. And we want to see that kind of stability for the future because that's what makes a great orchestra. If you have new people all the time, it's a much different story. It's not like working at a bank or other kinds of employment where it's not that important to have the same person in that job. Mm -hmm. But now, it is for us. Now, uh, when, it, when, when uh, labor makes a demand of employer uh, and they're successful, someone has to pay for it. So in this particular instance, uh, is the orchestra, the, the leaders, the employers, 
uh, I'll use your word, the employers, yeah. uh, are they arguing that you're going to your demands or your pension demands will bankrupt the Chicago Symphony Orchestra? No, they're they're saying that the trustees, that's the people who are entrusted with the management of the orchestra and the fundraising, they don't want to be on the. Uh, they don't want to have the risk of having to fund our pension going forward. They won't simply want to create a savings plan for the members and wash their hands of, of any guarantees. So we understand that, and we understand, you know, we're not uh, naive about this. This is a, a, an unusual situation, trying to keep our defined benefit plan. Mm -hmm. uh, there are plenty of orchestras that still have it and we think it's important for our future we're willing to give up a little bit on the upside to keep that mm -hmm. we're also willing to give up a little bit in salary to keep it but yeah. this is uh, a tough this is ideological our plan funded with a two percent increase every year costs 11 million dollars less than their plan over a 10-year period so it doesn't make economic sense this is just Somebody's made the decision. They don't want us to have a pension. All right, let's talk about it. It's ideological. Right. What does that mean? Well, uh, <laughs> what what is it? Uh, the, what is the opposition to? What what, what in particular it, do they have an ideological? Opposition I think to? this is a general trend that anybody who has a benefit that's guaranteed, whether it's. Um, you know, retirement benefit or health care benefit even, will find that being threatened because employers now as a, as a class don't want to have that responsibility. They, they want to just pay you for what time you're in there and that's it. And that doesn't build loyalty. It doesn't build, in our case, artistic quality mm -hmm. at all. It erodes it. So this is a much more fundamental issue for us than just the dollars and cents. Steve, do you think do you think that the people that are on the opposite side of the table are trying to use the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, the members of the symphony, uh, as an example? They want to set an example. They want to show the rest of the country, look, we're gonna this is the most professional uh group of union members you can find in the world highly trained years and years of training goes into this right. uh, this is the top this you know the, you yeah. can't these are not replaceable parts right. but we can we we're going to take away their pension plans so that everybody else everybody else throughout this is what you mean by ideological is what i'm right. getting at yeah. will never even dare to ask for a pension plan do you think it's like an ultimately like they're using you as a chip in a larger game absolutely yeah, I mean, and it's not just, you know, the other orchestras like the New York Philharmonic, the San Francisco Symphony, the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra that have these defined, at Boston Symphony, that have these defined benefit plans that are also now at risk, but um, it's any anybody else that has this kind of a plan, I mean, any other industry, any other profession. And it's, it's, um, it's pretty insidious when you get them right down to it. Uh, we didn't anticipate this level of irrationality from our employer. It's almost, uh, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. We're used to working out economic deals with our employer. Yeah. We have a lot of experience with that. They're not interested. Wow. The, the two-tier plan, uh, we deal with the, the very same thing yeah. in so many different contracts. And it, it happens on wages, on retirement, on benefits. And it is absolutely ideological. And one of the things that always happens uh, in places where they do this, we fight tooth and nail against this uh, always. Uh, but what often happens is you wind up with more of an incentive to employ these younger, lower tier folks than the right. older people. So you you find that uh, people under the original tier, they don't get the overtime or they might not maybe be called in to play a concert when you can right. get somebody new in. Um, so it pits employees, coworkers against one another. Mm -hmm. um, and it is ideological, even if it doesn't make financial sense, it's just kind of doing away with financial responsibilities, even if it's not a threat to the bottom line. And, and as you said, I mean, this is the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. This is a town that we take pride in our arts. And this is, you know, like my favorite show, the A-Team. Um, if what are they what are they going to do if uh, if these folks yeah. won't come back? Are they just going to bring in replacement workers yeah. to play at the oh. Chicago Symphony Orchestra? Yeah. I mean, how would how would people feel paying tickets to see 
well, these aren't the these aren't the best, but they're the ones we could get to do it for a little bit or you know whatever less money. Right. That's nonsense. Well, I I actually uh, remember when uh, going back to sports when the NFL brought in replacement players in the eighties. Oh, uh, it was uh, atrocious. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, the Bears, as bad as they are now, are still better than the replacement players that they had. Um, is it possible, uh, to follow up on what Ed raised, uh, Steve Lester, is it possible that they would bring in scabs uh, to play concerts? And Well, they could try, but uh, we're fortunate. We have a very strong union. Uh, the American Federation of Musicians and our Chicago local, the Chicago Federations of, Federation of Musicians, has been extremely supportive. And we've had a picket line out there every single day, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and nobody can cross that picket line. We have the support of our stagehands. We have the support of the building engineers. They've, they've been shut down. They've had to cancel all kinds of things that weren't us, you know, weren't the symphony. And I don't think they're going to be able to bring anybody in as long as we stay strong. And we're, we're up. We're there. All right, that's Steve Lester. I'm Ben Jarofsky and Maher also in the studio. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to talk to Steve about political pressure that could be applied to end this strike. We'll be right back. Ben Jarofsky Show is brought to you by the Chicago Sun-Times. For the latest in Chicago and Illinois news, sports, weather, and the latest in national news from a real Chicago frame of mind and real Chicago writers, check out the Chicago Sun-Times. Read the daily paper or online at chicago.suntimes.com. And hey, if you have a little extra cash, subscribe. And by the Chicago Reader. For a deeper dive in the daily Chicago news and for all of what's going on in this city, you gotta read The Reader. Music, arts and culture, film, extensive event calendars, concert listings, and more, including weekly political columns from writers like Maya Dukmasova and, yes, our very own Ben Jarofsky. The Chicago Reader is free in newsstands and at chicagoreader.com. That's chicagoreader.com. Welcome back to the Ben Jarofsky Show. Mr. Jarofsky, take us home. All right, that super cool music means the end of another super cool show. And I'd like to thank Ed Maher for playing the uh, organ over there on that one. Uh, <laughs> last time I Steve, know I Lester, do that. <laughs> Steve Lester was in the studio. I gave him credit for doing it. Uh, he's a bass player, he pointed out to me. I don't play the keyboard, Ben. Uh, anyway, Steve Lester from the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in the studio and Ed Maher from Operating Engineers Local 150. All right, um... Steve, political pressure. Uh, I'm very disappointed with our elected officials in uh, the Chicagoland area. Correct me if I'm wrong. Not enough of them, in my humble opinion, have come out uh, on your behalf uh, to try to put some kind of pressure right. Uh, right. on the uh, trustees that you're negotiating with. Right. We, well, early on in our strike, we got tremendous um, support from the congressional delegation, the Democratic con congressional de delegation of Illinois, from Senator Durbin, from um, uh, the candidates for the mayoral election. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, at this point, we need hands-on help. We need me mediation. I remember the, the days uh, of the senior Mayor Daley, and he would bring the parties in and into his office and say, you're not leaving until we have an agreement. Mm -hmm. And when it gets to this sort of um, polarized ideological fight, you need help from the outside. So we're, we are looking into uh, various avenues for that. I can't really talk about them right now, but I hope to have some news uh, in a day or so about that. But, um, you know, we've had tremendous support from the local unions. We've had uh, all kinds of, from CTU, from, from uh, uh, Teamsters, from uh, AFL-CIO, um, all the other unions that are under that umbrella have sent people to walk with us on the picket line, and it's been tremendous. So we're, you know, if I, I have to say thank you very much for all those 
tremendous support that we've gotten. Um, so, you know, we feel very comfortable about how the, uh, the, the people of Chicago are reacting to this. We get a lot of support every day. Our free concerts that we've given all across the city, whether they're the chamber concerts or the three big orchestra concerts, super attendance, super response from people. We haven't asked for donations yet, but we may be getting to that point soon. Mm. Ed, uh, is there tremendous sympathy like among rank and file members in your union for uh, the symphony? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I think we've got to we've got to get um, building trades in general uh, out there to join these folks. I mean, we saw it with the hotel workers' strike. There was support from from all different industries, and that's. That's what um, that's the kind of leverage that workers need to right. to to kind of stay stay the fight. Um, you know, as he said, they've got the the support of all the other various unions that put things together that make things happen at the CSO. Um, and having workers support generally, I think, just uh, helps strengthen them and um, puts them in the best position possible. Uh-huh. So, and and anybody who's not in a union, like if you're just if you work in the loop and you're walking by. Um, what I would just say is stop by and talk to yeah. these folks. I mean, you'll you'll realize people I think have a sometimes have a, a, a weird idea about striking workers or what that looks like or like dock workers or things like that. But stop and say hi. Sure. You'll realize these people are are fighting for the same things that you are, and I That's, mean, you'd be amazed by the talent, and the 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 education that they've got. Well, yeah, I, uh, I the point you made, uh, Steve, uh, thinking back to Old Man Daly. Uh, re- say what you about Richard J. Daly. Have m- my issues with him, uh, but he was very much a union man. Yeah. Came out and right. uh, there was no ideological opposition to the, the concept of a union, and so uh, I think he would have interjected himself, just as you said, and he yeah. would. And he was also the boss, and he would have brought people in. And I'm very disappointed. I have to say, uh, with Mayor Rahm for not uh, doing that. You know, he's heading out of office. Uh, what does he care? You know what I'm saying? If he offends somebody. Uh, and get them into a room together and say, all right, what is it going to take? You can, you can cut a deal here, you know. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm just very disappointed with the leadership. I could say this because I'm not uh, on the on the picket line here, but I'm very disappointed that uh, we would allow this to happen. Go on six weeks yeah. to the point where uh, you might have to take a, a fund together, you know, to make your basic bills. And oh, stuff. yeah, yeah. No, we've gotten uh, actually tremendous support from fellow orchestras, we got donations in excess of $120,000 from those other orchestras to help us manage our our expenses and some of the some of our members are hurting really bad at this point but um, yeah we'll be we'll be dealing with that i just wanted to add that if anybody wants to um, express an opinion about this situation or to offer support we have a website of course mm-hmm. chicago symphony musicians.com and you can contact us at our email Musicians of the CSO at gmail.com. And you can also follow us on Twitter at Musicians Sh- Shy Sim, Facebook at uh, CSO Musicians, and Instagram.com at CSO Musicians. Uh, all right. So we're, we're out there and um, we have information about future events and also on how to, how to contribute if, if you're so moved. We're, we're um, expanding into that area now. And uh, how will this affect, well, the, the rest of the concert season and then, then into the summer season with Ravinia? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a real issue because um, the CSO contracts with Ravinia for having us up there. Uh, so they will u- lose very significant income if we're not playing up there. And, um, you know, they're kind of lucky because they only have to plan uh, nine months of the year because Ravinia takes care of the other part of the year, you know. The summer season, and uh, but that's a that's a big ticket item for them, and it's really in everybody's interest to get this figured out and ended. But uh, there has to be a willingness. Uh, when you say the they, it's a big ticket. Are you talking about it's a it's a big issue for the symphony, or it's a big issue for Ravinia? Well, it's both because without us, they'd have to cancel six weeks, or have to find some way to fill them up, um, and for without our ability to perform there, our employers lose probably close to $3 million. Whoa, $3 million. Yeah. But they're willing to throw it away for that second tier of Cut a pension. Cut off your nose to spite the face. Yeah, yeah come, exactly. 
Um, come on, Chicago Symphony Orchestra, you can do a lot better than that. Um, all right, very good. That's uh, Steve Lester from the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Uh, Ed Maher as well in the studio. Uh, D, you got an update for me? Yeah, just two things. Uh, one, obviously, we're having our caption contest. If you're listening to this at the moment and you've yet to send us a caption, send us your caption. It's Donald Trump hugging the flag with a weird look on his face. We're going to read uh, the captions tomorrow and announce our winner tomorrow as well. And big news, our show is on back on the radio. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. We're back on the radio. Starting, Are we allowed to say that yet? Yeah, we're allowed okay, to say was, Starting tomorrow, uh -huh. Friday, <clears throat> excuse me, at 12 noon, we're going to be on Lumpen Radio 105.5 FM. Uh, it's going to be a replay of I uh, put in yesterday's show with Jason McGrath, Katie McFadden and Monroe Anderson. So tomorrow on Lumpen Radio 105.5 at 12 noon, you yeah. can hear the best of the Ben Jarofsky show. How about that? That's huh? Amazing. We're moving on. But getting back on the radio. I was on radio. They kicked me off radio. I do a podcast. I'm coming back to radio. Page 21. I'm yeah. reading the Mueller report page right page now. I'll tell you what, wherever I go, if that Chicago Symphony Orchestra is on strike, I'm having Steve Lester to come on that show <laughs> because I think it's outrageous. I'll say it. Again and again and again. I'm, my heart is always with the strikers. I got to tell you that, Ed Maher. It, I mean, just like a knee jerk reaction I got. I'm always with the strikers. Can't imagine somebody going on strike for something frivolous. Right. All right. Giving up a paycheck for six weeks, you figure you've got a really, really good reason to do that. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm with you guys 100%. I think it's outrageous. City of Chicago, I'll say it again, it wants to be viewed as a world class city and they won't pay world-class musicians what they deserve trying to break a union trying to turn it into like a two-tier system screw millennials are out there training to become high-class musicians you talk about getting bills ed maher college bills got college loans you got to pay off and uh so they just want to stick it to them so i'm with the chicago symphony orchestra are they it, uh, we're going to put uh, that information up on our Facebook page great, if folks want to get in touch with you again. All right, Steve? Thank you very much. All right, that's Steve Lester. Ed Marhiner as well. Can't uh, say enough about Mick Dumpke. Did a great job. Of course, the man, the myth, the legend. Pride and joy of Alton, Illinois. The ladies all love him for his body and his mind. Give yourself a raise. Take it out of petty cash. Dr. D behind the board. See you tomorrow, everybody. Hey, live streamers. You know, we you can download the show, right? If you missed any of the show, all you have to do is head to chicagoreader.com, chicago.suntimes.com, and you can download whatever part of the show you missed. Hey, downloaders, you know, we live stream the program. Yeah, we do. Every Tuesday through Friday, 1 until 3 p.m. Central Time, same website, chicagoreader.com, chicago.suntimes.com. And to help out Steve Lester and the Chicago Symphony Orchestra striking members, reach Chicago Symphony Musicians. Dot com their email musicians of the CSO at gmail.com twitter.com musicians shy sim facebook.com CSO musicians and instagram.com CSO musicians
This is Ira Glass. And I'm going to be at the Auditorium Theater talking about seven things I've learned in years of interviewing people and making radio stories and doing a TV show and making movies. And the whole thing is really just an excuse to tell a bunch of stories that are really fun to share and play clips and video and stuff we have not put on the radio and never will put on the radio. It's going to be Saturday, June 22nd. Tickets at wbez.org slash events. This WBEZ podcast is supported by Blue Man Group. Blue Man Group performances are euphoric celebrations. And as hardworking as the people of this great world passing me by, and I'm stuck in the... And trying to use this position to... Do you side with the good guys or the bad guys? If Trump... This is Ira Glass, and I'm going to be at the Auditorium Theater talking about seven things I've learned in years of interviewing people and making radio stories and doing a TV show and making movies. And the whole thing is really just an excuse to tell a bunch of stories that are really fun to share and play clips and video and stuff we have not put on the radio and never will. This is Ira Glass, and I'm going to be at the Auditorium Theater talking about seven things I've learned in years of interviewing people and making radio stories and doing a TV show and making movies. And the whole thing is really just an excuse to tell a bunch of stories that are really fun to share and play clips and video and stuff we have not put on the radio and never will put on the radio. It's going to be Saturday, June 22nd. Tickets at wbez.org slash events. Before we get started, we want to provide a quick warning. There's been some swearing throughout this series, but this episode in particular is full of strong language. After all, it is about Rod Blagojevich. If you don't like that kind of thing, or if you're listening with children, please be warned. Growing up, what was your opinion of the FBI? If you're in politics, you never have a good opinion of the FBI. We always saw the FBI as like the people that go after Americans, you know? Ask Chicago policemen what they think of the FBI. Ask a cop. They think they're liars. Part four. Hello? Hey, Rob. Hey. The tapes. Hey, um, you got a minute? Yeah. Um, what time are you thinking of going tonight? As far as the tapes themselves, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing with this podcast, a lot of people, they'll be hearing these tapes for the first time. So I guess to the average years, they're... What they, tapes? Well, the tapes that were presented at trial. Oh, you're putting those with the podcast? Well, that sucks if that's all you're putting and you're not getting my, our tapes on. But, I mean, that's just incredibly one-sided. How could you just do the... Yeah. You know, this is part of the story. This is part of the trial. They played these tapes. They were out there. Yeah, well... Patty Blagojevich is not happy with us using the tapes. And that's because of what happened later at trial. The tapes were the major piece of evidence that got Rod convicted, and excerpts that were played had all been carefully chosen by prosecutors. Rod and his defense team argued over and over that they wanted all the tapes played. They said if they were heard in their full context, it would prove that Rod was innocent and that he was mostly focused on the best interest of Illinois. But the vast majority of those other tapes, the defense's tapes, were never played, and they're still under seal. We explained to Patty that what we want her to do for us is to give context to the tapes that were heard at trial. Like when I said, F the Cubs, you want the context of that? I'll give you that context. You know, I, I would just, who are you talking to? Greenland. Tell me who about that fucking Cubs shit. Fuck that. Fuck that. Fuck that. Fuck that. Fuck that. Why should you do anything for that? Stand out. What kind of bullshit is that? What do you think of that, uh, Greenlee? So here's what's happening. At the time, the owner of the Cubs was looking for state assistance to renovate Wrigley Field. So Rod's a lifelong Cubs fan, right? And wants, would do anything to help the Cubs. But the Cubs owner also owned the Chicago Tribune newspaper, which had published an editorial calling for Rod's impeachment. Here's another tape from earlier that morning. Rod is talking about the editorial board at the Tribune. And our recommendation is, fight all those fucking people. Get them to fuck.
corruption here is endemic. During the Blagojevich investigations, Robert Grant was the special agent in charge of the FBI. FBI. He and his... I, and he was... I want you to get... Uh, uh, government in my interview. It's at that point of refusal. I began... Very bad. We were not aware of. The first time it was brought up in telephone conversations and it appeared he was going to try to monetize or capitalize on that for his personal benefit. Coming up next, the Senate seat. Oh, I mean, I, I've got this thing and it's fucking golden. This week on our Debt Recaps Game of Thrones with Peter Sagal. Greetings, listeners. Uh, Bill Nye here. There's no way Peter is right as often as he says he is. Okay, that's scientifically impossible. He was, in a very Bill Nye way, kind of nice about it. Yeah, he did seem kind of cool. <laughs> I know. That's Nerdette Recaps Game of Thrones with Peter Sagal. New episodes available every Monday. Find them at wbez.org slash throne. This is Ira Glass, and I'm going to be at the Auditorium Theater talking about seven things that... Late October 2008 to his arrest on December 9th. By this point, Rod's approval rating was at rock bottom. He just got back from a haircut. Wow, you sound like you just got back on the run. <clears throat> really? <laughs> We'd be doing... It was a complete surprise to me the first time it was brought up in telephone conversations and it appeared he was going to try to monetize or capitalize on that for his personal benefit. Coming up next, the Senate seat. Oh, I mean, I, I, available every Monday. Find them at W. Grandmother, a free fucking ride on a bus. Oh, yeah. Okay, I gave your fucking baby chance to have health, chance to have health care. I fought every one of those. Blagojevich for almost six weeks. From late October 2008 to his arrest on December 9th. By this point, Rod's approval rating was at rock bottom, and he wasn't able to get much done as a governor. Uh, Patty, I'm gonna, we, we've got a few more questions on these tapes. Okay, whatever. Fine. I mean, the tape that sort of sticks out is from the morning of the presidential election in 2008. And, you know, Rod is just, he sounds like he's in a bad spot. He says, I fucking busted my ass busted and pissed my people ass off and gave your, gave your grandmother, grandmother a free fucking ride on a bus. Oh, yeah. Okay? I gave your fucking baby chance to have health care. I fought every one of those assholes, including every special interest out there who can make my life easier and better because they want to raise taxes on you, and I won't, I, I fight them and keep them doing it. And what do I get for that? Only 13% of y'all out there think I'm doing a good job. So fuck all of you. What had him in that place at that time? Oh, yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I'd like to think that it was Rod, like, kind of like as the spurned lover almost to the people, you know, like, what else do I have to do? I mean, I'm doing, you know, the health care and the bus rides and the, you know. By appointing Madigan's daughter, Lisa, the then Illinois Attorney General, Rod could potentially. I wouldn't do it if I were. <laughs> right, anyway. Um... But those are not reachable. But, you know, I told my nephew, Alex, he just turned 26 today. I said, Alex, you know, I called him for his birthday, and I said, it's too, too bad you're not four years older, because I could have given you a U.S. Senate seat for your birthday. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I've got this thing, and it's fucking golden. Right. And I, I'm just not giving it up for fucking nothing. I'm not going to do it. And, and I can always parachute, use it, and fucking parachute me there.
I told my nephew Alex, he just turned 26 today. I said, Alex, you know, I called him for his birthday, and I said, it's just too bad you're not four years older, because I could have given you a U.S. Senate seat for your birthday. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I've got this thing, and it's fucking golden. Right. And I, I'm just not giving it up for fucking nothing. I'm not going to do it. And, and I can always parachute, use it, and fucking parachute me there. He sounds like he's in a bad spot. He says, I fucking busted my ass busted and pissed my people ass off and gave your, and gave your grandmother a free, free fucking, fucking ride on a bus. Oh, yeah. Okay? I gave your fucking baby a chance to have health care. I fought every one of those assholes, including every special interest out there who can make my life easier and better because they want to raise taxes on you, and I won't. I, I fight them and keep them doing it. And what do I get for that? Only 13% of y'all out there think I'm doing a good job. So fuck all of you. What had him in that place at that time? Oh, yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I'd like to think that it was Rod, like, kind of like as the... burned lover almost to the people you know like what else do i have to do i mean i'm doing you know the health care and the bus rides and the state for the people of illinois most good for the people it's too bad you're not four years older <laughs> all right anyway um but those are not reachable but you know i told my nephew alex he just turned 26 today I said, Alex, you know, I called him for his birthday, and I said, it's just too bad you're not four years older, because I could have given you a U.S. Senate seat for your birthday. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I've got this thing, and it's fucking golden. Right. And I, I'm just not giving it up for fucking nothing. Or did you reject that? No, that's really. Is it? I think so. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I... You Russian motherfuckers. Can you see me? <laughs> All right, anyway. Um, but those are not reachable. But, you know. I told my nephew Alex, he just turned 26 today. 
I said, Alex, you know, I called him for his birthday, and I said, it's too, too bad you're not four years older, because I could have given you a U.S. Senate seat for your birthday. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I've got this thing, and it's fucking golden. One of the consultants gives that call. It's no good. It's no good. I gotta get moving. The whole world's passing me by, and I'm stuck in this fucking job as governor now. Everybody's passing me by, and I'm stuck. Who's passing you by? Everybody. I mean, Brock just became president. A lot of people moving from Illinois, you know, thinking they're gonna go to D.C. and get into the administration, and and me nothing one of the consultants gives rod a heavy dose of reality he shoots down the idea of the president-elect giving rod any kind of government position in exchange for appointing obama's friend valerie jarrett so the resco thing is this cloud that's going to prevent this i mean he's not going to trade valerie for his reputation presidents don't do that you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. okay so what can i get from him for Patty and me, nothing. Later in that call. It's no good. It's no good. I gotta get moving. The whole world's passing me by, and I'm stuck in this fucking job as governor now. Everybody's passing me by, and I'm stuck. Who's passing you by? Everybody. I mean, Brock just became president. A lot of people moving from Illinois, you know, thinking they're gonna go to D.C. and get into the administration, and... Being governor was no fun anymore. It was all about trying to get things done for people.
So if he could, well. Barrett was going to accept a position in the White House as an advisor. For the political front, in that order. For any of that. None of us ever saw it as like. It's just grasping its <laughs> In her own right. Possible. Zero support. Don't like the idea. A tapes, he called. Government's based there. And you got to be careful how you express that. I call, I'll make that call. It's right to call the cops on some. But then. Recordings of me. Correct. And the feds were secretly recording the governor. On the night of December 4th, the newspaper called Blagojevich's press person to ask for comment. Then the press person called Blagojevich to tell him about the article. In the Tribune tomorrow. Correct. Recordings of me. Correct. December 5th, Chicago Tribune. Front page headline, Feds Taped Blagojevich. Well, I'm with an honest guy, I believe. Don't tell me I'm wrong about him. It put a, a, a damper on my relationship with, with Rod. He reads this in the paper. From that day on, it, it, it kind of forever changed. Initially, we were like in disbelief, like this is just, you know, we felt bad for John. How were they slandering him like this, reporting this? But.
Yes, sir. Check one, two. Yes, sir. Check one, two. Dave McKinney in the studio. Colin McNulty in the studio as well. Ben Jarofsky here. This is bonus time. Yes, indeed. As I speak, it's Thursday afternoon, but when you're listening to this, it's Saturday or Sunday or Monday. Podcast, you can listen whenever you want. And this is a segment of the show that I've been waiting to do for a very, very long time. I was in exile. I was like, uh, you know, wandering throughout the desert in Radio Land exile in between jobs when uh, a story broke on WBEZ, a podcast, I should say, broke uh, on WBEZ, public official A uh, by Dave McKinney, state political reporter. And uh, I was utterly obsessed with that uh, podcast. It's all about former Governor Rod Blagojevich. <laughs> Blagojevich, it's been a long day. And I said, man, I'm gonna have to have Dave McKinney on this show when as soon as I have a show so we could break, out, break down the podcast and do sort of an annotation of his podcast. So Dave McKinney, welcome to my show. Ben, thanks for having me. And uh, you brought with you Colin McNulty, who is the podcast producer. So Colin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. He's, right. he's the brains and the brawn of this operation. <laughs> he's the brains and you're uh, and the brawn? Well, you're just a yeah, good looking yeah, guy. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> you're the face. All right. <laughs> Uh, let's start, uh, Rod Bogoyevich, for our younger listeners. I think even our younger listeners know that he is the former governor of Illinois. Uh, Dave, why don't you just give them a little capsulated view, a view of uh, Rod Bogoyevich and what happened to him that led, sort of like led to the, uh, the uh, public official A. Well, you know what? He ran for governor in 2002. And if you, know, you turn on the Wayback Machine, we had a governor at that point, George Ryan, Republican, big corruption scandal that eventually led him to a federal prison term himself. Uh, Blagojevich comes in, a Democrat, first one in 26 years in Springfield, and he's running as a reformer. And really not long after he takes office, then, you know, you see these stories, including ones that, that you know, I wrote with Chris Fusco here at the Sun-Times and others, that he, he was basically, you know, he, he was operating this campaign fu fundraising juggernaut where virtually everything in state government had a price attached to it, mm -hmm. and 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 this, you know, eventually caught up with him. And in 2008, um, the the feds uh, swooped in with help from a bunch of uh, you know surreptitious recordings they had, and arrested him uh, at, at six in the morning on a on a you know weekday morning, and uh, and then you know not you know a couple of years later off he goes to federal prison and that's he's now in uh, Colorado serving you know he's halfway through a 14 year prison term that is a very good capsulation of the career of Rob Blagojevich so he yes is the governor that's currently uh, in the federal uh, penitentiary we've had a history of governors in Illinois have gone to the federal pen and right now there's only one am i right am i right about that dave am i forgetting a governor that's currently in the a federal penitentiary other than Rob Blagojevich? Well, he's the one and only from Illinois. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is very yeah. important to see. But yeah. the, you, really, a funny thing is, you're absolutely correct. When Rob Blagojevich first ran, he, he was positioning himself as a reformer. I found that very ironic, uh, Dave, because he, of course, his patron was Richard Mell, his father-in-law. We're gonna, we talk about Patty Blagojevich's wife is Richard Mell's daughter. And Richard Mell, of course, is a machine stalwart he's like so if you look up machine politician in a dictionary there's a picture of richard mel so it's kind of hard to run as a reformer when your sponsor is richard mel well yeah and i mean you know when we interviewed patty blagojevich for this project you know she was telling us a little bit about uh dick mel's expectations when when rod uh won his first term to congress back in the late 1990s you know he said put this guy on the payroll you know so and so for whatever it was 40, 40 grand thousand dollars yeah you know and rod, it, rod is says like he was some schmo that nobody else wanted <laughs> and and rod didn't understand why i had to put him on as a sort of like a machine job kind of thing and they had this big argument and that was their first blow up yeah that was something else i mean you know just the the whole family dysfunction is what you know really you know you can't say enough about what impact that had on Rod Blagojevich, and it really is, you know, well, let's just talk why he's brief, here. briefly about that. Rod, as I said earlier, is serving a 14 year sentence in federal penitentiary in Colorado for corruption charges uh, from his years as a governor. 
but the be- beginning of those of the corruption investigation, one could argue, came from a fallout he had with Dick Mel. Talk about that, Dave. Well, yeah, I mean, I think Mel, you know, Mel sort of regarded himself, as you pointed out, his patron and, and didn't think that Rod was being grateful enough. Um, he, he was turning at that point in time, Rod was, to this fundraiser named Chris Kelly. Kelly was, you know, a, a roofing contractor out at O'Hare. He had all sorts of city connections and and Rod was just leaning on him as an advisor, a money man, everything. And Mel felt left out. And and it got to the point where Mel, you know, just went public and w- with the Sun-Times own Fran Spielman about, uh, you know, everything, you know, every board and commission appointment available in state government is for sale for $50,000 mm. a pop. And and that became, it was like pouring gasoline on a, on a field of wild, you know, dry, dry grass. It mm. just took off and... and and, and it eventually doomed his president or his uh, governorship. Yeah, he would have and, liked to have been president. Yeah, we interviewed Lisa Madigan, who said when she heard that, finally there was somebody on the inside who had direct knowledge of how the Blagojevich campaign operated, and she opened her investigation. Mm. And then that morphed into the other investigations. There were, I think, three investigations going on at the beginning that eventually led to the FBI investigation. Mm. So that's why the genesis is with that argument with Mel. All right, well, let's now we're going to get to the heart of things and what uh, my obsession with your podcast uh, is the, the segment part four, the tapes. And I think that if anybody knows anything about Rod Blagojevich, it comes from the tapes. So before uh, we get into the tapes, I've got five uh, samples of Rod Blagojevich alive uh, as part of the tapes. And we're going to play them, each one, and have you guys annotate them and explain them and t- sort of put them in the historical context. Um, Dave, what, let me, before, we, as a way of introduction, uh, what inspired you to do this podcast in the first place? Well, I, I think, you, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether 14 years is too long of a prison term for him. I mean, you know, he's exhausted all of his appeals. You know, he, he's failed at, at trying to persuade the judicial system to take up his argument that he's that he was wrongly you know, sentenced. So what what happened in May of last year, President Trump was on Air Force One. And he was talking about another pardon. And then just out of the blue, brings up Blagojevich's name. And of course, the two of them have history together because they were on Celebrity Apprentice. And Rod, it was after Rod had been booted from office in, in need of money. And, and so he goes on Trump's show. And, and of course, he's a failure on the show. And, <laughs> and, and you know, but, but yeah. the fourth episode, I think, is the way he makes it too. Yeah, exactly. And so, so <laughs> Trump floats this idea on Air Force One. Well, you know what? This guy is in prison for the wrong reason. He, everybody talks out of turn. That's the only reason he's there. And, and he really kind of gave hope, I think, to Patty Blagojevich and the whole Blagojevich clan that, that he would give serious consideration to freeing Rod from prison. And of course, that's been. 11 months ago, nothing's happened. And I think there is a great deal of discouragement about, you know, where are you, Trump? Well, so, and uh, so when, when Trump brought up uh, Bogoyevich's name, that gave you the idea of doing this, this uh, podcast to take a deep dive into exactly what it was that brought Bogoyevich to prison? Well, because it gave it currency, you know, because we, we don't have, uh, you know, it's easy to go back and do these retrospective pieces that, that really kind of have this feel of a clip job. And that's not what this was. We, 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 we really used the Trump thing as a, as a platform. Way in. Yeah, a yeah. way in to kind of really go back in and remind people what this guy did when he was in office, Blagojevich, and then just sort of you know, pose this question about, is, did, did he get a raw deal or not? All right, and uh, by the way, one of the few things, and maybe one of the only things that I agree with Donald Trump on uh, is that I personally, this is me speaking for myself, I'm not speaking for anybody other than myself, I do believe 14 years is way too long. I didn't get along with Rod Blago. I can't even say that, Dave. I had no relationship. The guy never returned a call. I think Mel told him, don't talk to this guy. He's bad news. <laughs> so I never, even when he was a state rep, Rod Blagojevich would return a call. So I had no relationship. I don't know the man. But I think 14 years is too long. Uh, and I have a lot of questions having listened to your podcast uh, about what the FBI did, the decency of the, I don't know if there is such a word is even applicable to a federal investigation. Um, but it, I do believe uh, you're, 14 years is too long, and I just, I, I know, in my humble opinion, that um, uh, Donald Trump was raising the specter of, of releasing Blagojevich because he wanted to taint the reputation of the Mueller investigation into him, 
because Mueller, as I learned from your podcast, was the head of the FBI at the time the FBI launched their investigation of Rabogoyevich, correct? Oh, that's right. Absolutely. He, uh, he came to town and, uh, you know, he, he looked at the, uh, or he listened to these tapes, some of, the, some of which you're going to play here in a bit. And, and, you know, we have this anecdote from the former special agent in charge in, in Chicago, Robert Grant, who, who had uh, Mueller sit down at his desk and listen to these tapes. And, and after they play, um, you know, Mueller is just sitting there shaking his head and saying, only in Chicago, <laughs> only in Chicago. <laughs> no, he, he, yeah, go ahead. he also says, um, who's the guy dropping all the yeah, F-bombs? Yeah. And uh, Grant says, that's the governor of yeah. Illinois. Yeah, mm-hmm. he, he and Ro- Mueller apparently is not a swearer. Like, he's a proper gentleman who doesn't use words like that. So it was a bit shocking Well, to I'll tell you what, Mueller's been... Uh, he, Blagojevich introduced him to the real world and having investigated Trump now for the last year mm. or two, I think uh, Mueller's learned a thing or two about swearing and uh, explicit language. All right, um, so we're gonna, we have five, uh, what I consider the all-star uh, excerpts from the tapes. Uh, but before we get, we play uh, number one, uh, Dave, why don't you explain the backdrop of what led the feds to actually uh, tap Rod Blagojevich's phones. Well, I mean, they had taps in place at his campaign office and in his home. And the, these really, you know, of course, they took a, a, the approval of a judge. And it, it all really sort of started with, um, you know, their discussion with a, a, a close family friend of Blagojevich's and, and a, a lobbyist at the time named John Wyma, who um, he was representing a racetrack. And this racetrack had some legislation pending that Rod couldn't decide what to do. And and Wyma was was an intimate part of the or had been an intimate part of the uh, political operation of Blagojevich, and so he was involved in a lot of the fundraising meetings. And he saw firsthand how it was that that Rod was trying to attach fundraising goals to specific actions, including possibly signing a bill that would benefit the racing industry. And and so, you know. It was Children's Memorial mostly, too. Well, and Children's Memorial yeah. as well. And so he, he had this uh, situation where, um, uh, you, you know, I think the feds had interest in Wyma on other matters. It's, you know, we don't really go into that much in the show, but they, they had reason to talk to him. And, and Wyma volunteered that, you know, you might take a look at this guy, Blagojevich. He's got, you know, I, I know that he is, is offering to do certain things in government in exchange for campaign contributions. And then that was the basis to get the wiretap put into the campaign office and eventually the, the homes as well. All right. And so tape number one that we're going to play, uh, Dr. D, uh, is perhaps the best known. Am I right about this? Number we're going to go with number one? Well, you know, it, it, Colin, you're right. I, I, I misspoke there because the... the it uh, wasn't the racetrack. It was the, Children's it, Memorial. It was Children's Memorial. Yeah. And, yeah, and the, uh, the, the racetrack was, uh, was Schofield, right? Um, I'm blanking on this. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah, but but at any no, rate, no, it was Lon Monk. It was Monk. Yeah, that's yeah, that's right. Monk. Monk was. These the are all different aids to Rob yeah, McGoy. Yeah, yeah. but, but the greatest hits of Rob McGoy. Why, Wyma was coming at this through the perspective of Children's Memorial Hospital. Now, to you know, disregard what I just said. Okay. So so uh, Children's Memorial Hospital in town, of course, a big big provider of healthcare services for lots of of needy kids, and and they wanted to get the the, their reimbursement rates from the state of Illinois changed so that they would be paid more. The doctors there would be paid more and they could retain them easier. And and Rod was wanting to get the CEO of Children's Memorial to contribute $50,000 to his campaign in exchange for doing this. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, Wyma found that, he told us, to be pretty distasteful. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's what he, he used to flag to the feds that this kind of stuff was going on. The racetrack thing was a separate... Uh, an, an, another thing that was part of, you know, that the feds got on tape, uh, it involved another aide, Lon Monk, and, and it was a, a deal where uh, they were going to, the, the racetracks were going to get money from the casinos to, to help prop them up. And, and, you know, Rod was going to sign the bill or not sign the bill in exchange right. for money. And uh, so this was what led uh, ultimately uh, to getting the approval from a judge uh, to put taps on all the phones and uh, so he had his office phone, his home phone, what else? Um, his chief of staff's phone, uh, the campaign headquarters. There mm-hmm. were a couple of others, um, other people's phones. Besides so these are Boyers. landline phones, right? We're back yeah, in the Rod O's. didn't have a cell phone, apparently. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He, uh, because he worked at home a lot. So right. he 
they just had to do his couple landlines, I think, in his house. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah. all right. So, tape number one is perhaps the most famous uh, excerpt from uh, the wiretaps. Uh, take it away, Dr. D. I told my nephew, Alex, he just turned 26 today. I said, Alex, you know, I called him for his birthday, and I said, it's just too bad you're not four years older, because I could have given you a U.S. Senate seat for your birthday. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I've got this thing, and it's fucking golden. Right. And I, I'm just not giving it up for fucking nothing. I'm not going to do it. And, and I can always parachute, use it, and fucking parachute me there. All right, I got this. By the way, I should have done the little warning. I didn't do the warning, D. Uh, there's language in this show that you shouldn't listen to. Although you probably say it all the time, every day. That's the funny thing, Dave. People give these warnings out, and then they go out and swear to their wives. I'm not allowed to swear in this show. Uh, Dr. D, my producer, who generally orders me around, will not allow me to swear, all right? But you feel free to swear. Yeah, yeah. Blagojevich can swear. Well, we got to have some kind of rules around here. <laughs> I can't talk about sports. I can't swear. All right, let's that uh, we got this thing and it's fucking golden. Uh, it's world famous, I would say. It's probably the best known uh, quote from Rod Blagojevich. And uh, so, either one of you, I don't care. Just do the background of what this conversation is all about. I think that isn't that tape from the morning after the presidential election? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, 2008. Uh, in 2008. Barack so, Obama, Obama had just won the presidency. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I think we didn't, didn't Patty say, I kind of wish he hadn't a one because then that Senate seat wouldn't have been up for grabs. But basically, so they knew that the Senate seat was coming because if the president from, you know, a given state gets elected president, then, uh, or sorry, if the senator gets elected president, then the governor gets to appoint that replacement. So the Senate seat with Obama's presidential election or victory uh, was now in Rod's control. And that's what he's talking about that day. And the FBI had no idea that that was going to happen. They just happened to be up on the wiretaps when, uh, with all this stuff connection, you know, state action connections with fundraising. Um, so it was a surprise to them. And we, you know, the FBI agents we spoke to described that. They were like, all of a sudden the Senate seat comes along and they start hearing things about like that about it. Now, and that, that kind of piques their interest. It, it, did that change sort of the course of the FBI's investigation as soon as the Senate got involved, the Senate seat got involved? Oh, completely. It was a driving force, I think, behind the timing of his arrest because they felt like there was going to be some sort of imminent action where he was going to, mm-hmm. you know, basically sell the Senate seat. And I mean, there's this, you know, Patrick Fitzgerald talking about what, you know, what Rod was prepared to do allegedly in, in, in appointing this seat to, to, or giving this seat to somebody, you know, a donor that, that, that Lincoln would, would be spinning in his grave, you know? So, I mean, that, that was their big concern that they wanted to avert that. Yeah. I, I shouldn't point out here something a little aside, uh, that Senate, Senate seat appointment would take, would, would feel like, I think, about two years or a year or so until a special election would be held because they had a special election, right, to fill out the term. Am I correct on that? No, no, no. You're right. It was was two years. uh, They filled it. And right. And then the the term expired in 2010. Right. But one of the tapes that uh, was not played on your show because it really wasn't relevant, uh, Jermaine, uh, to the the prosecution was a conversation between Mayor Rahm, uh, at that point, Congressman Rahm, and Barack, um, and uh, Bukovic. I don't know if you guys heard this tape. Do you, are you familiar with this tape? Between where, Ram and Rod? Yeah, where Ram wanted, follow me on this, uh, uh, Obama was hiring Ram, offered Ram to be his chief of staff. Mm-hmm. Ram called Bukovic and asked if he, Bukovic, could um, fill Ram's vacancy with somebody that Ram chose, and he mentioned Forrest Claypool, to fill the vacancy and then Rahm would go off to Washington uh, and be the um, chief of staff. And then when he, would, when he was tired of being chief of staff, he'd come back and run for his office. And the, 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 the person that uh, Rod selected would leave office. You never heard this tape? Well, I mean, I don't know that it was part of the... Uh Part of what the feds did. I mean, that's, no, that's it, it, if it wasn't in the Blagojevich trial, we didn't. Use oh, it, it was. It yeah. was anyway. It's a funny little thing because the reality is uh, that uh, R- Rob Blagojevich did not, under the rules, have the power, the authority to fill a congressional vacancy. So, and uh, <laughs> Rob didn't even know the rules. Anyway, the point is, is that um, it's not that rare. This leads me to where I'm heading with this, Dave. It wasn't. It's not that rare for politicians to do something like this. I mean, they may not speak in terms like it's fucking golden but 
you know, there's a vacancy. It's wide open. People want to be considered. There's a lot of maneuvering going around. Uh, is, in other words, is this as dastardly as it sounds? Well, I mean, from a political standpoint, you know, Rod looked at it in a number of ways. I mean, you know, one of the people that he had talked about, um, you know, though she doesn't believe he was serious, but Lisa Madigan. And, and I think, you know, even though the two of them and, and Lisa's dad, the speaker, uh, you know, they, they, they clashed all the time with Rod. But, you know, Lisa was ambitious. Um, Lisa was uh, three terms, I believe, at that mm -hmm. point as attorney general. And, you know, he thought that by appointing her, it might enable uh, or it might buy him some favors with the speaker to help get a, a capital plan passed, an infrastructure bill. But that's, I mean, the, the point isn't the, what's it called, horse trading. Like, that, that's perfectly legal. And that's what the, you know, the um, Reed Char, the, the lead prosecutor, told us. It's, it's that he was exchanging the seat potentially for jobs, for, yeah. um, for income, you know. For I himself, to, absolutely. I need to make a lot of money, he said over and over again. So that's where it was potentially illegal, not the, the trading jobs for, you know, different political appointments. That's perfectly legal. Um, but, I mean, had, had he pointed out. Whether or not there's anything wrong with it is a different question. <laughs> Correct, but but, but, but under that legal. scenario, though, you know, he had Lisa. He had, if if it's to believe, be believed, you know, he then could have appointed an attorney general as well. So he would have had like a, a twofer there, and so you can see kind of the way the, the wheels in his head are working here. What's going to benefit me most politically? You know, mm -hmm. how, how can I get the most money in my campaign fund? How can I get the most done legislatively? I mean, all that stuff is kind of kicking around in his head. At all that right, point. and the other thing that uh, Dave McKinney makes very clear, uh, if you actually listen to the full podcast, is that it, the shock value of hearing the governor of the state of Illinois almost like naked, you know what I'm saying? I think you said it, he's so explicit. He's so explicit and that's sort of what is so eye-opening mm -hmm. just to hear like this raw, like uh, just unvarnished wheeling and dealing side of a political brain, a Chicago political brain, Dave. You understand what I'm saying? We're just seeing it in action and it's there without any attempt to hide or camouflage uh, from public view. Oh, it's so revealing. I mean, how many times, you know, would we like to hear, you know, uh, you know, one of the Mayor Daly's talk like that or the Speaker of the House? I mean, you know, you just don't have that kind of access that these government tapes provided us into the kind of the way that politicians think. All right, and along those lines, Dee, let's play this next tape. Uh, this tape shows... <laughs> a politician really feeling sorry for himself. I think this is the busted my ass tape. So let's hear this. He sounds like he's in a bad spot. He says, I fucking busted my ass busted and pissed people ass off and gave your, and gave your grandmother, grandmother a free fucking, fucking ride on a bus. Oh, yeah. Okay, I gave your fucking baby a chance to have health care. I fought every one of those assholes, including every special interest out there who can make my life easier and better because they want to raise taxes on you and I won't, I, I fight them and keep them it. And what do I get for that? Only 13% of y'all out there think I'm doing a good job. So fuck all of you. <laughs> <laughs> Our governor, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. I love that, man. I love. I think I like that tape even more than the fucking golding tape, all right? So <laughs> he was, fuck y'all. He was having a bad day that day. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Uh, a little context on the day. What was going on in that? Was there something going on in particular I should know about, or was it just a rough day in general? I think that was even before the Senate seat was up for grabs, right? That was he. He was reacting to seeing a <laughs> approval rating that put him at thirteen percent. I, I think see. which was one of the lowest in the country, if not the lowest, um, as far as approval ratings go. Uh, but and that was because of all the Resco stuff and all the other sort of indictments that were coming down. Well, and like, and everything was sort of sh you know closing in on him. All you know, this inner circle of his, you know, as, as Colin points out, they they were all they all had their own legal problems, and some of them were going to prison and already were in prison. And and you know, he he, it's it's weird to think about how you know Illinois. We had these two politicians, Rod Blagojevich and Barack Obama, at the same time in 2002. Yeah. If you look at their their trajectories, you know everybody thought Rod was on the way up, and and nobody knew who Obama was, and and then for 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 Blagojevich to have sort of flirted with this idea of the White House early in his term, and then to watch all of those dreams and ambitions just sort of be you know burned away, and and Obama going you know going to the White House, and and there's no place left for Rod to go, and and he's he's broke, and and politically he's at a dead end. 
He's and jealous. Jealous, and he's angry, and he feels like you know he's getting you know a raw deal from voters, uh-huh. and and just on and on and on. And you're right; he's feeling sorry for himself there. And um, you know, you, th- that 13 percent approval rating, you know, it was lower than W's. I think lower than oh, Bush's. It's, yeah. it's lower it's, than Congress's. At yeah, the time. I don't know. It's like it's it was like, basement. Yeah, yeah uh, but he was successfully really. Here's the weird thing. Uh, he had just been reelected. Let's take like a pause for a moment to think about the Illinois electorate for a moment. <laughs> he was just reelected, okay? He was challenged in the Democratic primary, and then he was challenged for 10 trivia points, Dave McKinney, who was the Republican candidate who ran against Rob Goyevich in 2016. Uh, she, 2006. She, 2006, she, 26, yeah. yeah. She loved uh, she loved her coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. You <laughs> parts of pink. Yeah. Give that man those trivia <laughs> points, okay? you got to get up early to sneak a... Illinois political question behind uh, David McKinney. All right, Dave. Now, I when I hear this, I laugh. It's funny. It sounds like uh, like a Martin Scorsese movie. Uh, you know. On the other hand, there's something voyeuristic about listening to a man's private conversations. And my goodness, if you heard some of the conversations I have with Dennis, my producer, it would be pretty embarrassing. Some of the things we say. Mostly, we do Howard Stern imitations. Den- Dennis, what what is that like? Can you tell us? <laughs> I can't talk about that. Sorry. <laughs> Off the record. He'll tell you about the Howard. He does a great Howard Stern. The point is, um, well, what's your feelings about this? You did the podcast. You, you're the one who put these tapes out there to a certain degree. Do you think we're being voyeuristic, listening, and chortling over this stuff? Well, I mean, uh, you know, these, these tapes were authorized by, you know, there, there were judges involved at multiple levels here. First, in, in allowing the placement of these wiretaps, you know, that had to be approved. There had to be probable cause established that there was going to be a crime committed. And then don't forget, you get into the trial and 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 Judge Zagel at that point pretty much listened to all of these. And and he made a determination as to which ones were germane to the case and which ones weren't. And, you know, Patty Blagojevich, uh, lover or hater, you know, she got drawn into all of this because she – um, you know, she was involved in a lot of real estate deals with Tony Resco, who was a fundraiser who, who wound up going to federal prison, a uh, fundraiser for Rod. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, they looked at her as, as, a, as a bit of a participant. And she, you know, her name is, uh, you know, she's identified in, in the indictment against Rod. Uh, she's not charged, but, but it's clear that the feds believe she committed wrongdoing as well. They didn't charge her. But, but that's, that's really, the, I think, the overarching purpose in, in the feds you know, listening to the two of them talk. Now they didn't, you know, none of them that we heard involved, mm-hmm. you know, just the mundane things that you would hear about, you know, day to day life in the Blagojevich house. But but the ones where they're talking about, well, gee, if I, you know, if I point myself Senate to the Senate seat, uh, uh, you know, maybe you know I could get this. Or if I if I uh, appointed. Valerie Jarrett, you know, maybe Obama would appoint me ambassador to India, and or you know, the UN the, ambassador, well, right? And there's a lot of jogging around the, you know, Indian. Uh, well, we'll embassy. get to that uh, ambassador quote, one of my favorites. But uh, uh, something else that Patty Blagojevich said, and uh, uh, Rob Blagojevich's lawyers have said this as well, uh, that the tapes that were pub- uh, released to the public, that were played in the trial, and that you eventually got access to. Um, are not don't tell the full story and I, you actually uh, quoted Patty Blagojevich saying this in your podcast that if the public heard all the tapes play all the time there's thousands of hours of tapes mm-hmm. they would see uh, that uh, Rod was uh, innocent a word I would not normally use in, in any way associated with anybody uh, having anything to do with Chicago politics innocence but uh, Talk talk about that. I mean, that's a serious issue. That some tape they were, uh, some tapes have never been played, and they've only allowed uh, a handful of tapes to be re- released. Talk about that. Well, I mean, that's that's really kind of the heart of their argument um, legally. But you know, the, the reality is they had two trials. They've had a whole series of, of of appeals where they've raised that point, and nowhere in the entire judicial system has anybody bought into that. <laughs> You know, and so so okay. it's it's fine to kind of yeah. you know kind of go down that route, but but you know reality is reality. They didn't get to play them, and if there was something that was truly remarkable in those tapes, at some point they would have found a sympathetic judge or a sympathetic justice who would have said, yeah, you know, you're right, mm-hmm. and and nowhere did that happen. 
Yeah, well, I just thought, I don't know, the whole politics of the Bogoyevich tapes, it, they arose uh, just recently in the, well, relatively recently in the 2018 gubernatorial campaign, as you recall, all of a sudden out of nowhere, the Tribune got started got access to tapes of conversations that Blago had with uh, then uh, citizen, private citizen J.B. Pritzker, of course, and now is our governor. And uh, Rauner then used, former Governor Rauner, used those tapes uh, to in campaign ads to slam uh, Pritzker and, and embarrass him and humiliate him. I mean, how did certain tapes get out and other tapes not get out? I don't think anybody knows how the the Rauner camp got got those tapes. I mean, those tapes would have technically been under seal. So, um, yeah, any side doesn't know. Well, and to be clear, I mean, Rauner, FBI Rauner didn't. Know. I, I don't believe the Rauner campaign had fingerprints on mm. that. I mean, this, you know, the, the the as you say, Colin, these are under seal, and the only people that really would have access to them are the lawyers in the case. And there were many, many defense <laughs> lawyers. Uh, who who had access to these? Now I'm not saying one of them, you know, had their own purposes and and, and had a candidate they favored or disfavored in the Illinois gubernatorial race, but but you know the timing of it was interesting because it was when you know the release of it came when Pritzker was in a primary and you know I don't know that there was any great um, doubt that Pritzker was going to go ahead and win that primary, but it it created a dust up and it it really undercut. Pritzker in the black community. I mean, it was it, some of the things that were being said on that particular tape were very awkward. Yeah. You know? Well, Pritzker then went on his apology tour. I will say this. Uh, I think I pointed this out to you, Dave, when we were talking on the phone. I say this all the time. It's so ironic. Uh, when Donald Trump started talking about uh, possibly uh, commuting the sentence of Blagojevich or talking about how Blagojevich was railroaded and how the same forces of uh, the federal government that uh, were persecuting him, Donald Trump, were the ones that had sent Blagojevich to prison with the same unfair tactics. That have very effectively undercut the issue of Rod Blagojevich in the campaign that Rauner was using because suddenly Donald Trump was making a pro-Blagojevich appeal to Trump voters throughout the world and like, yeah, they railroaded Blago, the same people that want to railroad your president. I just thought it was... Like, wow, man, is Trump couldn't have done a better favor for uh, J.B. Pritzker because you know what? Ronner stopped using those tapes in his commercials, if you remember it. They yeah, and I mean, they, they I, I mean, you, you kind of have to think, again, my theory that, that the Rauner people didn't have direct access to them. I mean, they would have been a, a much more effective thing to play in a campaign a month before the election as opposed to, you know, way early in the campaign season because in a way it kind of, you know, it, it just... It, it allowed there to be a lot of time between the playing of those tapes yeah. and when voters went to the, the, the polling places. Yeah, he may have pulled his punch too soon. All right, let's uh, uh, let's go to, <laughs> I call this the Walter Mitty tape. Walter Mitty is a cartoon, uh, cartoon character uh, from the New Yorker many years ago uh, who uh, always had these ambitions and great dreams of being something other than what he was. Uh, so this is uh, Blagojevich daydreaming about possibly... Uh, what is it, swapping the Senate seat for an appointment as an ambassador? Do I got that correct, Dave? Is that yeah, how yeah. the deal was going to go down? Yeah. He you was an ambassador, was, was, he was thinking. <laughs> All right, D, play the ambassador one. Now I have this as title as Russian Motherfuckers. Is that right? <laughs> That's Watch the your one. Computer. Wait, I thought, you, I thought there was no swearing. <laughs> yeah. in oh, I'm breaking my rules here. Uh, <laughs> you Russian motherfuckers. Can you see me? <laughs> <laughs> right, anyway, um, but those are not reachable, but, you know, <laughs> I told my nephew, Alex, he just turned 26 today. I said, Alex, you know, I call him for his birthday, and I said, it's just too bad you're not four years older, because I could have given you a U.S. Senate seat for your birthday. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I've got this thing, and <laughs> it's fucking golden. Uh, yeah. And... Yeah, that's good. The, the, the golden.